Bible in Genesis 1, chapter 1 says, in the beginning, God. God created. In the beginning, God. So we'll start today with God. So in the next two minutes, can we begin to pray? And we just reverence God and begin to bless his name for a day like this. Thank him for a day like this. Sam say, bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Thank Him for this evening. Thank you for the for thank Him for this program. Thank Him for the privilege to be called His son. Thank Him for what has been lined up for today. Let us agree that everyone joining in this program today, for someone confused, God will give clarification. For anyone asking for direction, instruction will come. Let's ask that the Holy Spirit dwells in our midst, even this evening as we go through all the items on the program. At every point in the program, there will be a word. This time I want you to pray for yourself as a point of contact to everyone in here. Say, Lord, meet me with a word that will change my situation. For families trusting God for healing and for peace, ask for peace. For someone trusting God for financial breakthrough, help and direction, ask God for instruction. Because the Holy Spirit is with us and Jesus says he will be our comforter, our teacher and helper. And the, above all, he will show us all things. Holy Spirit, this evening we welcome you and we receive your leading, we receive your teaching, we receive your guidance. That every word that will come out from the message and from the panelist and every word that will reach out to us today will be a blessing. None of us will live here the same way we came. But we will live with instruction and direction. We'll be we will live here enriched by the power of your word. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. And so our Lord and our God, we thank you. Thank you for this gathering. Because the spirit of life is in our midst, we receive instruction and direction today. Everyone will receive a word. Everyone's life will be touched. And all of us will be blessed to the glory and honor of your name. In Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. Let me see you type amen wherever you are from, so I know you are hearing me. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. All right, so I bring you greetings from the pastorate and the executive of Strictly Masculine Daystar Christian Center, the men's ministry of Daystar Christian Center to this wonderful program, making your life count, mandate, mandate. And I have someone sending there, what do you understand by manhood? What is manhood? Who is a man? What is manhood? Who is a man to you? Let me just read one or two things in a few minutes as I introduce what we have in store for us today. What do you understand by manhood? Who do you consider yourself to be as a man? I know all of us at some point in time, you've had some people say, and you call yourself a man. That's when you don't meet the expectation of what people term a man. But for you, as an individual, can I just see in the chat room one or two words or one or two sentences, phrases, or description that men can give? Who is man? What is manhood? What does manhood mean to you? They say, men, don't talk. Or you can be quiet on me. Can we just? The condition of being an adult, thank you, Brother Muiwa, an adult male. The condition of being an adult male. All right. Thank you, Brother Muiwa. Okay, so we work with what Brother Muiwa have said in manhood, condition of being an adult male. And I dare say it comes with his, the qualities and the responsibility. Thank you, Brother Clement. Responsibility of being a man. Responsibility of, of being a man. But we realize that in life, state of responsibility and dominion. Thank you, Brother Kola. But we realize that in life, men, we face a whole lot of challenges. We face a whole lot of issues as men. And then oftentimes we realize we go through this all by ourselves. Part of the things that we go through as men is finding a sense of purpose. Men often struggle to realize who they are, particularly who they are in Christ. We struggle to understand what our purpose is. We struggle to, and we have challenges in building and maintaining relationship. 
we have challenges with our father being a good father and meeting the expectation of the society of you being a father. Of course, we have challenges with our career. Some men have challenges with their body image. Thank you, Brother Sheung. Being responsible in the face of adversity, hmm, deep. Some of us have challenges with violence and aggression. A couple of men have challenges with mental health. We look at our mental health. We, we have challenges. This, this is even more common, balancing uh, our personal life and our work life. You see, a couple of us as men, we tend to face our work at the detriment of our family life. All right, then we have challenges in our finances and our responsibility. I was speaking with someone in church today and the person said, it's almost as if as one bill is being set with another one is coming up. And then you look at yourself and say, oh me, oh me. All right, some of us have um, challenges in our family and we expect more from our wives. But, but, but more importantly, we have challenges with expectations from the society as to who we are. And then these challenges put us in a position where we find it difficult to make our life count. We find it difficult to express ourselves and do and fulfill purpose and do what God has called us to do. All right, so this evening, we are going to discuss these challenges. All right, I have good news for you as a man. If you are thinking, why is my own different? Why am I facing this? And you know, in most time, in most recently, we we have challenges with our identity, and then we have challenges in what the society is expecting from us. And we we are in a, at times you are in a position that you can't cope. I have good news for you. In First Corinthians ten and thirteen, Scripture says, I read it from the Message Bible, the Message translation of the Bible. Scripture says, "No test or temptation." And I put in there in bracket, no challenges. That comes your way is beyond the course of what others have had to face. All you need to remember is that God will never let you down. He will never let you be pushed past your limit. God will always be there to help you come through it. What am I saying in essence, my brothers? Whatever you are going through, it's a challenge that is common to all men. And so this evening, I have the privilege and the blessing of God in the house, in the blessing of our pastor, Reverend Sam Adeyemi, who will be sharing, sharing words with us, in line with us making our life count. And after that, we will go through a panel of discussion, men sharing their experiences for you to know that you are not alone in this. You are, you are not alone in this. Um, I remember that song. You know, all of us will know it. How are you, my friend? How do you do, my friend? So, when I hear strictly masculine to say to you, you are not alone. The Holy Spirit is with you. No challenge has come your way. That is not common that others have not had to face. So we have a panel of discussion that will be taking all these items. At that point, we will have some time to send in one or two questions. And then the discussion will go in to encourage us. Help us out. I trust God. None of us will live here with the same body we come with in Jesus' name. So without much ado, because it is fully loaded. I, I want you to pay, pay close attention. Make sure you are listening. From the beginning to the end, something is coming your way. That will bless you. At home, will experience peace. Heart that is burdened will be lifted in the name of Jesus. Without much ado, let me welcome the President of the Spiritly Masculine, personal mentor to me, brother, and a role model in truth and in, in, in true and in real life, in experience and in practice. Can we put our hands together as we welcome Brother Kunle Tuneye? Thank you so much, my dear brother. I hope you can all hear me. I need a confirmation, please, that we can hear me. My audio is clear. I can hear you clean and clear. Thank you, Thank you so much, sir. 
Good day, everybody. Thank you for joining us in this life-changing meeting titled Mandates, Making Your Life Count. Please do us a favor, send the link for this program to your brothers, your friends, any man that you care about, any man that is there to your heart, you send this link to them now because we are, we are getting close to the high point of the program so that they can partake of the blessing. So for the benefit of people that are joining us for the first time, let me confirm that Strictly Masculine was established with a vision to raise role model men in society. Our mission is empowering men to become effective and godly leaders in whatever area of life God has positioned them. Today's program is our contribution to the commemoration of Father's Day and is designed to celebrate men and share our common challenges while we provide workable real life solutions. As we have been informed, we have an able panel of men from three different generations who will be sharing their experiences and taking questions from the audience. So before I bring up our main speaker, I'd like to just invite all of us, all these star men on this call to please join our men's community on WhatsApp. It's called the Men's Lounge. The Men's Lounge is a free and spontaneous platform for engagement by men. We discuss all kinds of issues. We have seen all kinds of testimonies. Men exchange business connections. They share their needs. They discuss their opinions. They influence each other. They share testimonies. It's been awesome. It's been awesome. If you are not there, please, we will be sharing the link to join in the chat room in a few minutes. Please just click and join if you are a DSTA member. You will not regret it, I promise you. Secondly, we also have a prayer room. Of course, we are men that are mature. We have a prayer room called the Strictly Masculine Prayer Room, where we pray every last Friday of the month. If you join the link, we'll put the link there too in a few minutes. If you join through the link, you will be able to be a part of our prayer every month and some of the other things that we do. We also share testimonies. We share prayer requests. And there have been several testimonies recorded already. I can bet you, you will not regret it in the mighty name of Jesus. And then for those of us that are in the Lagos area, you can take advantage of a special arrangement that we have with a gym called Ivory Health Club. It's for all registered day men to join at a discounted rate. You can join on your own. You can join with your family. The rates are unbelievable. We all know the, what the rates are for to join uh, gyms around here. But we have been able to, because of our numbers, we've been able to negotiate a very, very well discounted rate. So if you are anywhere around the Keja, if you are not too far from the Keja, please take advantage of it and join. We'll also be putting our helpline number. If you have any requests, any, any concerns, any challenges, any suggestions, about strictly masculine, I'd like you to please just reach out to us through WhatsApp. You can be sure change is the only thing that is permanent in this star. We will attend to your requests and make adjustments where possible. Thank you so much, everyone. So at this point, we're going to be taking a special message from our father, my father and pastor. It's my privilege and honor to read his profile, even as we bring him up to bless us. Tamadiemi is a dynamic teacher, a success coach, a leadership consultant, and pastor. His book has excellent leadership and success power, can be viewed on satellite channels all over the world. He is the senior pastor of the Star Christian Center, Lagos, Nigeria, with over 40,000 in attendance on Sundays. He founded the Day Star Leadership Academy called DLA which is dedicated to raising a new generation of leaders who will serve as catalysts in the transformation of Africa and the whole world. 
As of 2018, over 30,900 have graduated from the school. He holds a Master of Arts degree in Leadership Studies from the University of Exeter in the UK, and a Doctor of Strategic Leadership, which he obtained from Regent University, Virginia, USA. He is married to Nikkei Adeyemi, who co-pastors with him and ministers healing to women and children through the Real Woman International and the Love Home Orphanage. They are blessed with three adult children. Brethren, let's give a rousing digital welcome to my pastor and your pastor, Reverend Sam Adeyemi, as he comes, us, comes up to bless us. Thank you, everyone. Praise the Lord. That was just the test. I love it when men say hallelujah, right? With our deep voices. I think it makes music in heaven. Okay. So let's try again. Praise the Lord. All right, all right, all right. So it's a it's such a big blessing to be a part of the Strictly Masculine program today. And I'm absolutely certain that um, we're having an amazing time, right? Absolutely. So a big thank you to our coordinator and our pastor in charge and the leadership, the leadership team of Strictly Masculine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for doing a great job. Um, Leading men is work, okay? <laughs> well, you're doing an amazing job, so thank you. All right, so making your life count. Let me share for just a few minutes and we'll carry on with our activities, right? Making your life count as a man. So the verse of scripture that came to me, you know, is from Genesis chapter 2. Because when Christ addressed serious issues, he would say, but from the beginning it was not so. Like, let's go back to the original pattern. Okay, let's go back to the original pattern. Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, New Living Translation. Wow. <laughs> so, what does that suggest about our purpose? You know, we're managers, we are influencers. We are environment shapers, right? Because God created the environment and then he put the man there, you know, and said, take care of it. I believe that a man is one who cultivates potential. A man cultivates potential, you know, uncovers possibilities in the environment and in people. So that's what I want to talk, be, talk about a little bit, right? You see, the other word used to describe leadership is the word head. And that word is used in 1 Corinthians 11 within the context of marriage says that the man is the head of the woman. Say, okay, certain things happen in the head. We need to check what the function of the head is. Before we begin to assert ourselves, I am the head of this family, or I am your head. It's good to understand what the head is supposed to be doing, right? Number one, vision. You got to have vision. If your life is going to count, you got to have vision. Please remember that the eyes are in the head. Yeah. So I describe vision as the ability to see 
people, places, and things, not just the way they are, but the way they could be. You know, it's one of the remarkable things I noticed about Christ. Vision. That he would see someone and give them a nickname. Because he, he was seeing them beyond who they were in the present. He saw Nathaniel. He said, a true Israelite indeed, in whom there is no guile. The guy said, how did you, how did you know we're just meeting for the first time? Says Simon, son of Jonah, says, Peter, rock. So that's vision, right? So when God puts the man in the garden, if you go back to Genesis chapter 1, verse 29, God said that I have put trees, I created trees for you, and I put fruit on them. He said I put seeds in them because that is what will produce what you will eat. So before we can cultivate potential, we've got to recognize it, right? We've got to recognize it. There's this famous saying, you can count the number of seeds in an apple, but you cannot count the number of apples in a seed. You can count the number of seeds in an apple. Now, you see those seeds with your physical eyes. So, but you cannot count the number of apples in a seed. You can't see that with your physical eyes. You see that with your imagination. You see possibilities. You take one seed, you plant it, it goes into an apple tree and then produces loads of fruits. You eat the fruits, but then you take all the seeds in them, plant them. Then you have a lot more apple trees that produce much more, many more apple fruits that have a whole lot more of apple seeds in them. You plant all of them. Oh my God, you have a forest of apple trees, but you only see that with your imagination. A man has got to be like that. Christ is the ultimate man, right? Our ultimate model. And he said in John chapter 5, verse 19, the son can do nothing except what he sees the father doing. He said in verse 24, the father loves the son and shows him whatever he himself is doing. It's powerful. Yield your imagination to God. Let him paint pictures of the future. Let him paint pictures of the future. Right? Good. So, to a large extent, therefore, the more mature we become as men, the more vision we have. Amen? Absolutely. And vision is one of the major qualities or characteristics of a leader. I, I always refer to the experience in 2 Kings chapter 6, you know, from verse 13, where the king of Syria sent a battalion of soldiers to arrest Elisha. And Elisha's servant woke up in the morning, saw all the enemy soldiers and screamed, <laughs> my master, what are we going to do now? And the old man said, fear not, for those that are with us are more than those that are with them. What was Elisha seeing? beyond the physical. And when he saw that the young man was struggling and could not see what he was seeing, he prayed. He said, Lord, open his eyes that he may see. The Bible says the Lord opened the young man's eyes and he saw chariot, he saw, he saw horses and chariots of fire around Elijah. He come down. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ, for everyone that is a part of this program today, receive the miracle of open eyes. I know most of us have seen things before. Right now, I pray, receive enlargement of heart. Receive bigger dreams in the mighty name of Jesus. See, when it comes to having dreams, I, I always refer to Joseph. Most of us do, right, in the Bible. And I ask one question, how do you respond to adversity? How do you respond to adversity? Because there was a young man who was growing up in his father's house. And they said his older brothers did not treat him easy. They treated him harshly. They spoke harsh words to him. They, they bullied him. They oppressed him. How did he respond? I want to believe that he prayed because God gave him a vision. He said, I had a dream. 
And in the dream, all of us were in the field, we were binding our sheaves, and then at some point, all of your sheaves bowed down to mine. <laughs> His brothers were angry. He was establishing clearly, I'm going to be in a leadership position sometime in the future. I saw something happen. He did not create it, he, he just caught it. Okay, maybe the mistake he made was to say it, but usually you're supposed to say it anyway. <laughs> The problem was not with the fact that he said it. The problem was with the immaturity of his brothers. Okay? Anyway. Joseph responded to the harshness in his environment with vision. And I'm saying right now, I know that the environment around the world is getting tougher and tougher. Things are getting harsh. And that, and that some of us may be struggling, maybe with our career, maybe with our finances. And these have the tendency to impact on our relationships. For someone with moving your health, I prophesy in the name of Jesus Christ. The hold of the physical experience on your mind is broken. I prophesy in Jesus' name. Your eyes are open, your inner eyes. And the Holy Spirit will show you something that is coming because the future is beautiful. Amen. Making your life count. You've got to have vision. Number two, be creative with your words. Be creative with your words. Words are powerful. Proverbs 18, 22 says life and death are in the power of the tongue. So when man finds himself in whatever garden he finds himself, okay, maybe at work, maybe at home, maybe in the neighborhood, uh, freshness. Our world, since sin came into this world, things have been rough, right? So it's not a perfect world. People are going to hurt us. People are going to misbehave around us. This is important. You take a cue from what God did in Genesis 1, verse 2. And the earth was formed and void and darkness covered the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was moving upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. Come on. Enough of reacting. Enough of using our words to describe the experience. It's time to speak miracles. It's time to release the creative force of God. Amen. You will look like a madman. <laughs> no, no. Play the scenario. Mark 11. Uh, Mark chapter 11. Verse 23, Jesus said, whoever will say to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he says shall come to pass, he shall have whatever he says. You picture it. Won't you look like a madman? Standing in front of a mountain and speaking in the name of Jesus, I command you this mountain, move, jump into the sea. But that was what Jesus did. He said that in response to the question asked by his disciples. He spoke to a tree like a crazy man. Nobody will eat food from you again. And then the next day, they saw that it had happened. That's why they were asking him, what do we do? Said, Exercise faith like God. Superimpose spiritual realities on the physical. Let your words be creative. To those of us that are married, by the time your wife hurts you, if you're not careful, you will receive the anointing. Hmm? Anointing for annoyance. When you use it to speak, it's you that will use your mouth to turn her into a witch. You don't make that mistake. So when God was going to fulfill his promise to Abraham and Sarah, what did he do? He changed what they were calling each other. So you find yourself in an environment where you're running yourselves down. Everybody loses out at the end of the day. As a man, as a man, establish your position. I'm only going to prophesy. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> I'm not going to allow the devil to use my mouth to spoil my environment or to ruin anybody's life. Okay? Be creative with your words. Number three, focus on others. Focus on others. If your life is going to count, then focus on others. You know, we say it over and over in this that your life is too small to be the purpose of your life. <laughs> say you're looking for your purpose. Yes. 
put the focus on other people. Naturally, though, we're self-centered. Okay? So we think about ourselves. Now, nothing ruins relationships like being in the relationship, you know, and focusing on oneself. So what's the purpose of relationship in the first place? <laughs> if you wanted to focus on yourself, you should have stood all by yourself, right? Philippians chapter 2, verse 3 says, don't be selfish. New Living Translation. Philippians chapter 2, verse 3. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Verse 4 says, don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. Period. Easy. Honestly, you want to have influence with others, make impacts, you know, on other people, learn to focus on others. Number three follows closely. Number three follows closely. Focus on giving, not getting. Focus on giving, not getting. Okay? Focus on giving, not getting. Acts 20.35 said that the Lord Jesus Christ himself said, that it is more blessed to give than to receive. Be a giver. Be a giver, right? <laughs> the principle already guarantees that you will receive. Be a giver. Be generous. Be large-hearted as a man. Be a giver. And next, focus on your growth. Focus on your growth. Yep, I'm making it brief. So that, that's my last point. Focus on your growth. So you will see that your growth, because you are influential already, your life has consequence already. See, whether you are deliberate about your influence on the environment and on other people or not, it will happen. Now, it will happen for good or it will happen for bad. My challenge is be intentional. Be intentional. The earlier you start, the better. The earlier you start, the better. Okay, so this is not only about oh, married people. Oh, no. Once you are old enough to recognize yourself as a male, this is for you. Focus on your growth. In 1 Corinthians 13, verse 11, all the apostles said, when I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, and I thought as a child, he said, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. I like that. The proof of maturity is change. Change in your habits, change in your behavior, change in your character. That's it. Look at the testimony about Christ in Luke 2.52. And he said, he said that Jesus grew in favor with God and with man. And that he also grew in wisdom and in stature. Four years. He grew, he increased in favor with God and with man. Increased spiritually in his relationship with God. Increased in his social relationships with humans. He increased in wisdom. That was mental maturity. He increased in stature. That was physical maturity. All around growth. That is what makes a man. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. When I became a man, I put away childish things. There has got to be putting away. Put it away. Focus on growth. Focus on your growth. Because it automatically changes your relationships. Focus on the way men treated women in the Bible during Christ's time. Chauvinists. <laughs> you call them male chauvinists. They said they caught a woman in adultery in the very act. And that they brought her to Jesus. They told him, the law of Moses says, when we catch somebody in adultery like this, we should stone them to death. 
What do you have to say? You see that he did not rush to answer? That's maturity, right? <laughs> he got an inspired answer. Their hypocrisy was smelly, thick. Any one of you who has not committed any sin, I give you permission. Throw the first stone. And the Bible says that they left from the greatest to the least, from the oldest to the youngest. They left one by one until all of them disappeared. Hypocrites. Where was the man? How can the woman be committing adultery all by herself? Where was the man? Mm. Okay, so, the more mature you become, the more you let go of prejudice over tribe, over political affiliations, okay? over color, over race. In fact, over social status. In terms of social status, you know, your heart is filled with love. That's the proof of growth. That verse that I quoted, 1 Corinthians 13, verse 11. You know what 1 Corinthians 13 is about? It's the chapter on love. It's the chapter on love. The more capacity you have to love, the more mature you are as a man, and the more your life is going to count. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, sacrificial love. That's it. So I love Bible characters. And one of the ones that inspires me the most, or one of the ones that inspire me the most, is David. Okay, David in the Bible. Now, I'll tell you one major thing that was characteristic of him. He was filled with the Spirit of God. I want to say that it's going to be difficult for you to realize your potential as a man without being filled with the Spirit of God. After we have finished here today, and you are back. Let me give you an illustration. Maybe you're a married man. <clears throat> Satan will show up. It's just that you may not recognize him. If you are the son of God, turn this stone into bread, right? He will test you based on this word that you just had. You remember Jesus said, uh, the sower sow, sow, sowed the word, and some fell by the wayside, and the birds of the hair came and took the word immediately. Yes. You will hear something that wants to throw you up, <laughs> throw you off course. But you just remember. If you are filled with the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit will prompt you. And the moment he does, you obey him. That is proof of your maturity. Perfect obedience to the Holy Spirit. So it is only someone filled with the Holy Spirit who, who will obey God and who is seen beyond the normal that will run towards a giant like David did. Am I right? Yeah. Did he save the environment or not? He did. Did he save his country or not? He did. The Philistines came to overrun his country. He was able to save the whole country under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Because while everybody saw Goliath and they were running away, he saw Goliath run towards Goliath. He said, God is going to take him out. I know God is taking him out. <laughs> He's finished. He told Goliath himself, I'll kill you, I'll cut your head. And the birds of the hair will come and take your body, okay? So please be filled with the Spirit of God. Amen. <laughs> Let's always be filled. Please pray. Instead of saying something negative, just, just, Santa before you call somebody a witch, okay? And don't forget, God gave Adam the power to name anything. And they said, whatever Adam called them, that was what they became. So by the time you say, oh, I regret marrying you, honestly, I regret marrying you. You're a problem person. You're pro something is wrong with your head. Something is wrong with your head. It's not in there. You're talking like a foolish person. You're an idiot. Men are usually annoyed. Men get angered to that point. I'm just saying it will be a big mistake. Okay? You're going to fulfill your destiny as a man. You're being called to cultivate. Okay? Called to manage the garden. There will be thorns in some places. But that shouldn't make you a negative person. Amen? We'll remove the thorns. And our greatest instrument is love. Hallelujah. Capacity to love. 
Don't forget the points. Don't forget, number one, you got to have vision. Number two, you got to be creative with your words. Number three, you got to focus on others. And number four, okay, I said you got to focus on giving, not getting right. And you got to focus on your growth. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ that grace rests on you today to fulfill your destiny as a man. I prophesy in Jesus' name, whatever it is that tries to make a dent on your self-esteem, power is broken in the name of Jesus. And I speak by the authority in the name of Jesus Christ. Any negative cycles Satan created that is now creating a pattern in your mind, like that's how it always happens. I destroy it. The way it always happens for you is blessing. It is success in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. I pray in the name of Jesus for restoration. God promised us this year there will be a resurrection, there will be restoration, there will be resurgence. Whatever it is that has been taken away from you, I prophesy it is returned now. I receive the ministry of angels on your behalf in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Wherever there is stress, I prophesy peace in the name of Jesus. I prophesy the release of God's wisdom in an unusual way. And finally, if anything or anybody stole your joy, your joy came back now. Your joy came back now in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. All right, thank you for having me to be a part of the Strictly Masculine uh, program today. I am looking forward. <laughs> Amen. Yes, I am, I'm going to be a present physically one of these days. All right. Thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your day. Oh, my. All right. Can we appreciate God and the grace of God in the life of Reverend Sam at DME? Can I see people throwing emojis appreciation to Reverend Sam for that word? In fact, my, my heart is in acting a good matter. I'm, I'm dancing all by myself and basking in the euphoria of those prophetic blessings and the word that have come out. I'm a cultivator. Can we in the next few minutes just throw in the punchlines and what we enjoyed, what we got from, from, from that? Beyond those five points you mentioned, is there any point when he was talking that something just, something just eat you? For me, yielding my imagination, making, seeing, you know, you know, so, someone says, eyes that look are common, eyes that see are very few. So seeing goes beyond our physical eyes. He said something as to our inner eyes being open, miracle of open eyes that we may see with our mind. I realize we see more with our mind. So what we look at resonates with what we have in our mind and then we can see. So for me, I'm going home with that fact that I need to dwell more in the word of God. And for me, another thing he said is be filled, be filled with the Holy Spirit. So when I'm filled with the Holy Spirit, I will not react to what I'm seeing physically. I will react to that feeling in the inside of my mind. And that's what, once again, that's what I will see how. And, and, and we just appreciate appreciate God. Someone had gracefully put on, on the chat room the five points. Five points. And the beauty about this that is, you know, this, this is on demand. We can work it over and again. All right, I don't want to waste our time. I want us to go to the next item. But before then, can you help me appreciate Pastor Boye Oloide and all other pastors on this call? Pastor Boye Oloide is the supervising pastor for Strictly Masculine and the head of center operations in this Star Christian Center. Can someone just send a message and say, thank you, Pastor Boye, for joining us. We love you. Thank you for being part of us. All right, all right, all right, all right. Our highest of understanding will be enlightened. We will see, and we will see clearly. Oh, oh, oh. That's just a message that every man needs to, to, to have now. So we prioritize our growth, increase in our work with God, increase in our relationship, increase in wisdom, and increase in stature. Somebody say, this man, you want to increase this stature that 
We still have yeah, yeah. An increase in stature. My pastor said I should increase stature. Amen. We we will go to the next item, and the next item is having a panel of discussion. And we have lined up fantastic, fantastic men who will take us further in our discussion in making our life count. So beyond those words, if you have questions, we can drop one or two lines of questions as um, I introduce a panel of discussants, those who will be discussing with us, who will be sharing life example and what they've gone through. Remember that passage I read in the beginning? Absolutely nothing that has happened to you that has not happened to other men. All right, so you are not in it alone. We are all in it together. And like Reverend has said, when we are filled with the Holy Spirit, is the third party in our equation that will help us out. I'll first introduce one of our panelists by the name Igbinoba or Sasenaga. We call him Naga for short. Naga currently leads the performing arts and performing arts team of the Star Orb. He's an all-round creator with all expressions in both traditional and performing art spaces amongst other diverse sectors. A graduate of the University of Guinea where he studied theater and performing arts. He presently works in the design and communication field and is simultaneously building 258, an art consortium. He's also a growing strategic thinker who has been able to build working systems in various spaces of influence from the Christian space to the paramilitary and business space. is committed to building more confident, expressive and godly people. And this has led to crafting safe spaces where people can express, be real and explore God in the realest of forms. Gentlemen, brothers, can we welcome Brother Naga, Igbinoba Osanega. Let's put our hands together Thank virtually. Thank you very much. As we welcome, as we welcome Brother Naga. Thank you, Brother Naga, for joining us. I quickly introduce Thank you very the, much. the second person on the panel. And the second person on the panel is a gentleman's gentleman. I usually say to myself, when I grow up, I want to be quiet, gentle and known as zooming as he is. He's a leader in Daystar Christian Center. He's one of the zonal coordinators, a married man, blessed with children. He's been campus fellowship and Christian fellowship leader since 1992 in NIFEST. He was the president of Nigerian Christian Corpus Fellowship in River State during the year that he served. He has over 25 years experience covering IT telecoms. He has managed several projects in the telecommunication space, ranging from wireless network planning, fiber optics projects, spanning over 5,000 kilometers across Nigeria and network operation across 10,000 kilometers of optic fiber network for both enterprise and mobile networks. A recipient of Distinguished Alumni Award for the Faculty of Science at the Federal University of Technology, Akure. Apart from consulting, our panelists also facilitates training on strategy, risk management, and teaches leadership as a volunteer for tertiary institution students in Nigeria. A graduate from the Federal University of Technology, Akure. Gentlemen, let's work, make welcome the CEO of the Frontier Consulting Limited, Brother Aburi Shadi Oluwarotimi Babatunde. Good evening, let's, sir. Let's send in emojis and welcome. Welcome, Brother Rotimi. Good evening, sir. Gentle and quiet. The last person in the panel. Uh, I don't know where to start from. Let's first welcome, he's, he's a father to all of us on this, I make bold to say all of us on this call. 
a mentor to plenty, is an inspiration to a whole load of people, I dare say, in the country. Is an elder of elders. A member of the Board of Trustees in Daystar Christian Center, a national director of Full Gospel Businessmen Fellowship. Gentlemen, we have the privilege of having with us someone who has a BS degree in mechanical engineering in the University of Lagos in the year 1972. I repeat it, he has his degree in the year 1972. He has worked before as a manager in USC before he started his own business as the chairman and CEO of Teco Group of Companies, Total Engineering Concepts in 1980. The School of Business Success was founded by this great man of God in 2007, and he serves as the president and chief executive officer. The school raises entrepreneurs based on scriptural principles of integrity and sound character. A member of the New York Academy of Sciences, a fellow of the Nigerian Society of Engineering, a member of American Society of Mechanical Engineers, and former chairman of the Nigerian Netherlands Chamber of Commerce. With 40 years experience in business management, a motivational speaker of repute, and author of two fantastic books, one, Success is Your Birthright, and two, Growing Wealth Without Sweat. Married to a PhD holder who lectures a higher institution and executive director of School for Business Sector. It's my great privilege and honor to welcome as um, our panelists today, our daddy, engineer Charles Aladdiwood. Let's welcome him. Much. Let's make him welcome. Welcome, sir. Welcome, sir. Thank we you are grateful much. for your presence. Men, no ladies. <laughs> we appreciate Thank you, sir. God bless you. Welcome. All. Welcome, sir. All right, to moderate this section um, of panel discussion, we have in the house a man we all call Prof. A great man who adds humor to counseling and sending his message in appropriately. A first class bachelor's degree holder in estate management, a teacher, a lecturer, and human resource person, a human resource professional, someone who is into marriage counseling, a coach and teacher of over two decades. We call him Prof. Gentlemen, we have the privilege of our moderator, and it's my great privilege to welcome to this section of panel discussion, Brother Yomi, far away in me, and I hand over to him as he takes this section off. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, thanks for the very great introduction. Let me thank and appreciate uh, all the panelists and uh, everybody still on the call. I can see about 362 people on the call. I want to thank you for your time. It's a great thing as men to gather today. Tomorrow is Father's Day. So it's nice that women are able to talk. Hey, I know, I know many of us are happy and proud to be fathers. I know Father's Day is about <laughs> Is our everybody who is male? I mean, some fathers have biological children. Some fathers don't have biological children. Some fathers are fathers to be. Some people, some males have chosen not to have biological children. It doesn't exempt you, whatever you are in that spectrum, whether you are trusting God for children or whether you are you already have your own biological children. Everyone is a father. You know, I know the very interesting thing is that. If you read many stories in the Bible, we read about men, but we don't know about their children. You know, people would naturally give the example of Paul. I mean, of course, Paul did not have children because he was, he was not married. We give the example of Jesus. Jesus did not have children because he was not married. But if you remember the number of people that Paul called his sons in the Bible, you will know that he didn't miss out not having his own biological children. And that does not underrate the fact that we, we, we children are a blessing. It's just that it's possible for a man not to have biological children, but to have many more children 
who are not biological. But you know, think about somebody in the Bible, the man called Mordecai. If you remember the story of Mordecai in the Bible, Mordecai is features prominently in the book of Esther. Do you know that we don't know whether Mordecai has children or not? All we know was the fact that Mordecai had a relative called Esther that he adopted and became a story maker. And you know, the, the, the theme for this session is making your life count. The only reason why Mordecai is in the Bible is because of Esther. But Esther is just a relative of his. So you may not, you, you, you don't, your relative may be the person that will make your life count. It was because of the relationship between Mordecai and Esther that his life counted. You know, very important for us to think about, about that house self, that cousin that lives with you that can make a difference in your life. Uh, and the same with mothers, so, so that you don't think I'm only assuaging you because of men. When Moses was going to, was born and they wanted to kill him, the mother went to keep him beside the river. And the Bible says the daughter of Pharaoh came and picked him up and adopted him. Do you know we never knew whether the daughter of Pharaoh had children or not? The only information we have about the daughter of Pharaoh is because of Moses. So the only reason why the daughter of Pharaoh, in fact, you know, the Bible did not even tell us her name. We don't know the name of the lady. It just says the daughter of Pharaoh. The only reason why the daughter of Pharaoh name counted and got into the Bible is because of what he did with an abandoned child. So you may be driving on Ikosi Road, you may be driving on Shomolu Road, you may be driving on Top Milan Bridge, and you see a baby, maybe that's the next Moses, and you treat the Moses well, maybe that's what will make your life count. So it, our life counting does not necessarily mean because we are biological children. So we're going to go to the group conversation, and our conversation is going to be structured around what Pastor Sam has said, uh, it's important for us to put that at the back of our mind. And the goal at the end of this session is to fulfill the vision of the organizers, which is that we want the life of the men around us to count. And Pastor Sam has graciously mentioned four things. I hope I got them right. He said we needed a vision. He said we needed to speak creatively and speak positively. He said we need to focus on others. And he said we should focus on growth. So our conversation will largely go around that dimension just for us to be able to, because the goal is to ensure alignment with what has been shared and deepen the conversation for that. So we're good to go. So I'm going to start with the uh, first question to which we we'll go to Brother Rutimi Abori Shade. And my question is that how can you get a vision in practical terms? So Pastor Sam had said we needed vision. He mentioned as, in fact, that was the first thing he mentioned. He gave the example of Joseph. Joseph dreamt, you know. Now, some people will not dream. Some people, when they dream, they only dream they, they are eating rice and beans. So what are the practical ways that we can receive this vision? I mean, if I don't dream, if I don't have a spiritual experience, are there ways that can I receive a vision even though I did not have a dream? Borrow to move back to you. Okay. Thank you, bro, Yomi. Good evening, everyone. I hope I'm clear enough. Am I clear enough? Okay. Yes, you are. Okay. So, yes, sir. Okay, so essentially to, to have personal visions, you know, um, generally because we are Christians, you know, we have to pray. You know, prayer helps us, you know, as a baseline for most things that we do. But beyond prayer is that we, we need to ask ourselves honest questions. Questions like, you know, what kind of legacy do I want to leave behind? What are those things that are very important to me? You know, so if it's your career, you know, that will shape, you know, the kind of vision you have for your career. If it's your career, if it's your family, there are women that money means very little to, for example, they just want to be with their children. You know, so if we ask questions like, what is important to me in life? What kind of legacies do I want to leave behind? Uh, what are the qualities that I seek to, to develop? You know, so questions can point a lot to questions. If we ask honest questions about ourselves, or we ask honest questions to people that know us very well, who we trust their sense of judgment. That can also assist us in, you know, in casting personal visions for, for our life. And then on top of that, great meditation. You have to be a thinker. If you are going to 
be able to you know come up with a vision for what you want to do for your life you have to spend a lot of time you know thinking asking yourself honest questions those will be my response for now Thank you, thank you, thank you, brother. Thank you, Barotimi. Uh, great point. Uh, thanks, I do. So, Barotimi has said we can think, ask questions, meditate, and ask people that know us very well. Of course, if I need a vision, he's one of the people I will ask. I believe that he's perhaps the person that knows me the most in this time. <laughs> so, I mean, I think I think part of one of the things he says, therefore, is that we need to have people that know us well. I mean, as they know us, you know, if they will say one more, you're daily, daily. You know, when when some people that know you well, that they know you so well that they can tell you when you are going crazy, and you will not argue with them. You know, thank you for everything. So I'm going to turn over to Engineer Lady Walu, and uh, please maximum respect to Engineer Lady Walu. In this group, is the oldest of the panelists, and so uh, <laughs> I have to call him Engineer. I call him Engineer Lady Walu, not because he's an engineer, but I can't call him Brother Lady Walu. <laughs> will not be righteous. So. To, to maintain my spirituality. That's why I call him. And I don't think he would like me to call him Baba Adelaide Wolu. So he's engineer, because that's the safest thing to call him. So, sir, I go on the role here as a great in Yoruba land. Amen, amen. So, a uh, question to ask you today, sir, you know, again, too, I need to also respect that uh, I should not be asking elders question, but you know, I'm standing on the authority. I have a mandate to ask you, sir, on behalf of the younger men. So, yeah. one thing I said, how we can get a vision. So how can I be sure my vision is genuine? I mean, Nigeria just finished elections, right? There were over 20 people that had a vision to run and they didn't win. I mean, so how do I know whether this vision is genuine? And can you give a, you had a vision and you felt it was a vision and it didn't happen? Well, thank you very much. First of all, let me thank the organizers of this program. This is extremely very, very, uh, nice for our young and fairly old members of the church. Um, yes, vision is uh, simply very important. You need to know why you are here and um, what you intend to pursue in life. And there are many of them, but one thing I want to bring forth is the fact that uh, uh, right from the very beginning, when I was getting, uh, when I just got married, I, I said to myself, I wouldn't like a house boy or house girl from Kotobu, from Calabar to take care of my children. And the implication of that is that my wife had to resign her job and take to full uh, control of the home. But then it means I have to be the one that is going to work and uh, making all the needs of the family. And then uh, I have to pray for the Holy Spirit to lead me because I want to be sure that when these children grow up, uh, they are not uh, not served by people whose uh, background I don't know. Maybe they're worshiping all kind of idols in their account. So my wife agreed, and it should be. But uh, and today I am so grateful that she did, although she lost a lot of years because our youngest child had to go to uh, body house in, in secondary school before my wife decided to go back to work. But we found that having to stay home for many years, she needed to upgrade herself. So. She had to go back to school. Now today, she is a PhD and a principal lecturer and head of department. So what we thought she would have lost, she has gained. And she received the respect of both myself and all the children for the sacrifice that she made. And I'm so happy that all the children turned out so well. They are in international companies, and many of them in their own uh, companies, and they are doing extremely very well. So it's very important right from the beginning to have a vision of uh, where you are going, where your family is going, and then have a way of discussing with your spouse how you really want to achieve this vision. And I'm so happy that uh, we agree that way, and it has worked out. And I want to uh, say that I had to pray and do things to make sure that I was able to earn enough to take care of uh, the family. And uh, God helped, answered my prayer. All the children went to you know, some of the very best universities internationally. And today we are very proud of them. So I will say more about uh, this vision thing later. But uh, I just want you to know that if you have a vision and you pray about it, and you make the Holy Spirit your senior life partner, things will work out well for you in Jesus' name. 
Thank you, sir. Uh, thanks for that, sir. But I'm going to recast the question and I'm going to just give you one minute, sir. Please pardon me to give you one minute. I like to share one, I like you to share one experience where you had the vision and it didn't work out. Because I mean, the 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 the, the I mean the reality which is of this is that we receive visions various ways. But as there have been cases where you had a vision and it didn't work out, and you realize after the fact this is not genuine. Yeah, well, there has been uh, <clears throat> um, business vision uh, that sometimes you are not very well prepared for uh, business uh, and I have uh, got to learn from that mistake that uh, business uh, is, uh, you have to develop uh, a, a business idea to be able to make a business to work. Not all ideas, human and idea comes to you and just jump at it. It may not work and it didn't work, but I have got to know that there is what is called business idea, different from just general idea. And for an idea to become a business idea, it must uh, satisfy what I call IMF uh, uh, functionalities. For example, my I, it's not IMF, it's not International Monetary Fund. Uh, my own uh, IMF is, is that the idea must be implementable, it must be marketable, and it must be fundable. There is no need to generate an idea which you cannot implement, the product and services which you cannot market, and uh, a project or, or an idea that you cannot fund until you bring the product to the market. So the first one I jumped in without uh, making all the necessary preparations, uh, prayerfully, it, it just didn't work, and I have learned from that. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, thanks for that example. And I think we all got the acronym IMF, according to engineer Ladivo, implementable, marketable, and fundable. Very, very important. Okay, so we, we've done we've done some conversations around vision. And remember, please, you can also send in your questions. Um, that we'll take at the end of this session. So I'm going to turn to the next thing. So Pastor Sam talked about having a vision, then he also talked about the way we speak. So I'm going to ask uh, Brother Naga to, to respond to the issue right. of, so men have the challenge of when they are annoyed or when they are under stress or when they are disturbed, uh, they say wrong things. They get annoyed, they call people names. I know Pastor Sam actually yeah. mentioned this specifically in the case of married people. So. If a man has that weakness, thanks Samuel Olaye Misa for helping us write the IMF for business ideas. So, uh, Brother Naga, if a man has that weakness that he says the wrong, yeah. how does he change? How does he transform from that to somebody who says the right thing? Uh, good evening. Can everyone hear me? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, so the first thing, um, we have to realize is that when people say things about themselves, they basically speak based on um, the the things that are in their head. That is the the preset, what their parents have said about them, what they've, what they've heard close people around them say. So many times, when people people say what is in is already in their subconscious. So the first thing is when you hear yourself speak bad or hurtful things about yourself and you want to change that, the first thing you have to do is to catch yourself. That, so, so, and I've learned that with myself that when things happen, the first, the second, even to, maybe to the tenth time, you, might, you have to catch yourself. You have to catch yourself consciously. Maybe you say, oh, I'm not enough. You have to catch yourself and reverse it immediately. And if you keep doing that long enough, you keep doing that long enough, catching yourself, whenever you're angry and you say the wrong things, you catch yourself, you say the right things. Not just catch yourself and say, oh, I said this word. When you catch yourself, you say the right things. When you say that, you enforce, you keep enforcing the right things. And since your spirit man listens even more than your regular ear, even more than your physical ear, the spirit man listens. The more you, the more you replace the former things. For some people, they might have to say it more than others because the more you say it, the more you replace the former things that were there. The more you replace the former book vocabulary that was there. And with time, even when bad things happen, the fact that you have new vocabulary, the fact that what is in your mind has changed because of the consistent reinforcement, you now are able to say the things that are right. So it does not happen just once. You, When you catch yourself saying the wrong things about yourself, you have to pick yourself, tell yourself that thing. And 
when you there's there's so much power when you correct yourself. When people correct you, that's one that's one level. But when you start correcting yourself and telling yourself this is who I am, and how how better the Bible when we read the Bible when we speak to God when we commune with the Holy Spirit, we are able to know the things that God has said about us. And those are the words we used to correct the the wrong things that we have said to ourselves or that have been said about us that have now informed how we think about ourselves. So as I said, you you so. In, in proper arrangement, first of all, your communion with the Holy Spirit helps you know the things that God has said about you. So when you say the wrong things about yourself, you now replace those wrong things with the right words. And the consistent replacements of those words help you become better and, how, um, and help you see the right things about yourself. So that's what, that's what I've learned and that's what I think. Thank you very much. Thanks for that. Thanks for that very brilliant contribution uh, on the fact that we need to have the self-awareness. I mean, coming from the place of the Holy Spirit, being aware when we say the wrong things, are catching ourselves yeah. and trying to reprogram ourselves, which, which is very, very important. I'm going to come back to the question of what's, what we say again, and I'm going to ask yeah. Brother Rotimi this question. So, um, so if I follow what Brother Naga said, and I do that, and I still realize I'm still struggling. And so I'm not going to only situate it around, uh, around um, speaking, any habit that you want to change as a Christian and as a man. What other things do you think we can do to improve or to change in, in that direction? Okay. Okay, thank you, Royomi. So essentially, if you want to change anything about yourself and I can use myself as an example you know many people say I'm very gentle or quiet those who don't know me well but you know I saw a trait in my dad as I was growing up and I became a Christian you know quite early in life my dad doesn't look for trouble but if you look for his trouble he's well and able to go to any extent to defend himself. And even though I became a Christian very early, you know, I, I, so I learned not to look for trouble because I, I'm a Christian, but people still look for your trouble, whether you like it or not, you know. And I realized I was behaving, I was taking after my dad in that respect of saying, you know, I don't look for anybody's trouble, but if you look for my trouble, you know, I'm going to come after you with all of my being, you know. And I reflected on a couple of experiences I had. And these are even well before I became 20, you know, and I realized that, no, I can't be the kind of Christian I, I would love to be if I continue to just, you know, take after my dad in this, in this regard. So one recommendation I have is to first do self-evaluation. I always tell people, self-government is the, is the most powerful government. If you govern yourself very well, hold yourself to a high standards, you know, and you are able to reflect. You don't just excuse yourself for bad behavior. You will be able to make progress. That's one. The second one, you know, Beyond, I'm assuming we're all Christians, so I'm leaving prayer out, you know, in many of the things I'm saying, you know, so I assume that we pray, I assume that we read the word of God. So I'm, I'm speaking to practical steps, you know, so one is self-evaluation. The second one is to have accountability partners, you know, and I have people, you know, so if I'm confused now about something in, in, in Desta, in, 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 about my life, you know, I'm saying, you know, amongst those of us who worship at Desta, you know, there are two people that, even if you ask people who know me very well, they will say, no, but I wrote to me, we'll talk to Brother Toye, you know, or but I wrote to me, we'll talk to Prof, you know, and we always ask questions to say, you know, I've seen this, I'm thinking about this, you know, what do you think about it, you know? So have people that can hold you accountable to, to, to the highest standard, whether it's your spouse, whether it's a male friend, whether it's a colleague or a pastor, you know, have people that you can, you know, you can go talk to and say, you know what, I mess up, you know, and they can hold you to, to high standards. So I will recommend those two things. And then thirdly, you must be willing to make a change. You know, like I said, I saw 
that I was behaving like my dad in that regard that when people come to look for my trouble, I just want to you know, use all of my being to, to defend myself and give it back to them. But I made a decision to say, I don't want to be like my dad in this regard. He's a fantastic man in many other regards, but in this particular regard, I don't want to be like my dad. And I, I made that mental shift as I pray, as I meditate on the word of God, and I, I hold myself accountable. I hope that's, that answers it. Thank you, Borotumi. Thanks very much. I really like the 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 uh, the response you gave around. You said, "I will not be like this." I mean, you know. So when Pastor Sam was talking about having a vision uh, about how we want to make our life count, I think there is also a dimension of that vision that sees what we want to be, but also sees what we don't want to be, because you know there is a way in which we define vision in 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 from the positive frame of mind. That vision is seeing things the way they are, but it's also seeing yourself as what I don't want to be like this. And I dare say there is nobody in this world that has made it in life that does not define what he doesn't want to be. Uh, and, th and thanks for that. So I, I just want us to be conscious of that. Pastor Sam emphasized the importance of using the right words. Uh, Bro Naga gave us examples and steps you can take. Bro Timmy gave us his own personal experience on how to deal with that. Uh, and I like the fact that, you know, uh, you know when it was mentioned in uh, Brother Naga, I was thinking about, now I'm sure many of you know Mama Tao. Mama Tao, one of the comedians, you know, Tao Ma's kids. You know, uh, I wrote an article around it sometime about, about the psychology of Mama Tao, you know? So Barotimi said, I won't fight, but if you fight me, I could respond, you know? So, you know, Mama Tao is that Bugwara Nija, every day be guided, there's fight, there's no fight. You, you are slapped before you explain, slap, then explain later, you know? And you know, many of us as born again Christians, we are not like Mama Tao, we will not slap that way. But the problem is that if they slap us, what will we do? Interestingly, what Jesus already answered the question, he said, when Mama Tao slaps you on the left cheek, what did he say you should do? Turn the other cheek. So part of the, the, the Christian responsibility is the ability to withhold himself and not just be, be bullish or be positive in terms of this vision thing and say, okay, I want a vision to be, I want to be this. There's also that vision of if Mama Tao is my mother, or my friend, or my neighbor, or my wife, or whatever. If he slaps me, I will not return the slap. And I think that is a bigger proof of our Christianity that maybe some of the things we are able to do outside. You know, Jesus helped us finalize it when he was listing for us the fruit of the spirit. He added one, and I tell people that's the most dangerous, called self-control, you know? the ability to restrain yourself. So as we're talking about getting better, you know, the, of the four points Pastor Sam spoke about, the one that is about shifting, and that's where I'm spending quite some time, that is, that is about shifting a bad character to a good character is the one about our tongue. So that's where I'm going to spend, we we'll spend a lot of time. So I'm going to come back to Brother Nuga now, and then I'll come to Brother Rotemi, and then I'll come to Engineer Lade Wolu. I want you to just mention three things or three challenges of people in your generation and how, and just talk about one of them in a way that we can learn to overcome it. So three things, I mean, so in my, in, for people in my generation, uh, one challenge that many in my generation have is they dance too much, they talk too much, they jump too much. Just mention, just these three and just discuss okay. one in a very positive one about that. Uh, uh, Mr. Samuel Lodi, uh, it's on Facebook. Okay. Uh, it's, it's, all right, so let me go to Brother Nuka. Brother Nuka, you start. Uh, please, you speak for your generation, same time we have. Okay. Hello. Um, so, fairly new one per se is the attack on masculinity. So, that's one. Number two, there's a very there's an issue with confidence, confidence, and uh, and um, what what let's say is the third one. Um, basically, confidence being the second one, and the third one being uh, I don't, no, the third one's not coming to my head. But before I, before I finish, I uh, want it to come up. So when I say the attack on masculinity, right now with a lot of things coming up about the LGBTQ, same sex, this and that. There is, it feels like it's wrong to be a man. It feels like it's wrong to be a man. It feels like everything must be feminized now. If you are not acting, uh, if, you, if you speak up 
about being masculine in this generation. It's like it is an issue. Um, if you're not, there, there's the conversation of being being soft, being this, and it does it does not mean that masculinity is always heavy, heavy, heavy. When you speak about being a man, a man, a provider, a guide to the family, a leader, it always now in this generation, you look as if there's an issue with it because with the world view on masculinity, it's like everyone has to conform to to something. I want you to speak about oh, a lot of men are are towing the gay line and all. You are you are being cancelled. So that's one of the major problems, and it's a problem that's going to increase very very much. And one of the reasons why I feel is is because one of our major um, calling as Christians is to be fruitful, multiply, and not just only like have your children alone. Like um, one of the one of the panelists said, you being able to lead people, you being able to 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 bring people up. And right now, with the least, with the with the reduction of men, with the reduction of masculine men, that is that is is going to affect. That now many men don't want to multiply. Many men feel like, oh, that's not what they want to do. And as men, it affects us so much because we're meant to, we're, on us, we're meant to be the leaders and all. So, so that's another problem. Another problem is the issue with self-confidence. Nowadays, the world has become so materialistic. It has become so materialistic that, um, and, and the way people try to get wealth these days is, has become an issue. To the, to the extent that now people go the illegal line, and then they brandish it in your face like, oh, this is what it is. And then that affects some, some men because they, and they, they don't have these things that people are using to show off. They don't have, they don't have it right now. And many of them are not, wait, are not ready to wait. So that lack of confidence takes them into vices. Okay, so the third thing is, is vices. Vices have been around for a long time, but I'm still on the side. And I've, I've learned as a man that it's not just about what you have. It's about who you are. Many times, it's who you are that even brings what you have. It's who you are and how you believe in yourself and how you told your name that brings you to what you have. Oh, many people don't know this. So the lack of that self-confidence makes them um, controllable. So they are not able to stand for the right things. Many men know what is right. But because this, it drops their confidence to the point where they are not able to stand for what's right. And I feel our world is in a place where it needs men to stand for what is right. We like like one thing I've learned is in the business space, there's so many Christians, so many people that know what is right. But there's few that are controlling it with the wrong narrative. And many of the Christians we that know what is right, we are silent in the face of, of that truth. And so so that's one. Then the third thing is vices. Nowadays, as men, it looks as if you have to be something to get some things. When I was in school, there's some things you had to do that before you could do something in in, in legal organizations, you had to join a cult. You have to sleep with this person. You have to do this. You have to do that. So many men face these vices. And because they don't know who they are, and they have not been able to grow and face and, and surmount challenges, so they've, 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 they've not been able to get to the point where even in the worst situations, they take their stand as to who they are. These vices make them drop. The vices of cultism, the vices of, of um, fraud, the vices of... Um, fornication and all, many things. So they, have, they, they, they start to fall for these things. So those three things, the attack on masculinity, the lack of self-confidence, and, and crazy vices that affect men all around, all around. So those are, the, those are three things I can think of right now. Those are the things I can think of at this point. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Bruno. You got great points. Uh, the attack on masculinity, the issues around... Um, confidence of men and also about uh, very bad vices. Uh, Borrow to me, please, can you uh, respond to the same question? Okay, thank you very much. Um, so essentially for me, uh, for my generation, I would say that the biggest issue for men is that their lives have been reduced to performance. So whether it is by providing money or sex, you know, um, or even professional satisfaction. You know, life has been reduced. There are many men that are unhappy today because they've not been able to define their own vision and stick to it. So if I write 
a 2016 car and brought your me buys a 2024 car, I become sorrowful with what I have. You know, so life being reduced essentially to performance. You know, if I have 100 million and brought your me has 200 million or 1 billion, I become sad. If I, you know, so life being reduced to performance is a big issue for my generation. And it has made many people to dip their hands. In fact, I tell people, many men who still at work, still because they want to impress their family primarily. You know, I know there is a greedy lot class above that, but many men, an average man who is stealing, or who's doing something wrong, is because he wants to satisfy his family primarily. He wants to end that performance quotient so that they will say, oh, daddy is able to do this. My husband is able to do this, you know. I, I was telling a story a few days ago in my office of a woman who would go and buy jewelry, you know, as far back as 20 years ago, half a million. And she will be showing everybody in the office. She will come in. Can't you see that I'm sick, you know, tripping my husband in my late 40s? Is still spending this much on jewelry for me? Three months down the line, they will come and drag her in the office to ask for money for the same jewelry that she has not paid for. So there are many men today who are, who are under pressure, who are breaking down because their lives have been reduced to performance, whether it's about money, professional career, business, sex, you know, et cetera, et cetera. People even get drunk because they want to show people that, you know, I can do six bottles, I can do 12 bottles at a go. So the, 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 the call, the pressure to, to perform is, 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 is what I would say is the biggest issue for men in my generation. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, great point. Uh, Boris May just mentioned one. I know um, just to buttress that, you know, uh, you know what they describe as midlife crisis that seems to happen to men between the age of 45 to 55. And the psychology behind that crisis is that when the men look back at what they have done and they are comparing it, that performance to some other people and they are not satisfied, they come to come crisis. You know, uh, there's a very popular Nigerian that I see a lot of action that midlife crisis. I know when, when Brother Rizmo was talking about performance, he mentioned sex. You know that social media is another performance business. You know, when you see a man that is close to 60 or 60, who is posing and showing off his shoes and showing off his glasses and his swagger and saying he's living soft life, it's, uh, it's a reaction to the past performance because he didn't have to do that. Uh, mm -hmm. When Michael Jackson had that problem, we quickly understood because we were wondering, we were able to understand what was the problem. But now when you're a big boy, and you have the same crisis in your life. People will say you are showing the soft life or you are motivating people, but uh, the, your, matter, your matter is on the agenda of the devil already because to prove that that's not the problem, you will need to justify uh, the performance quotient you identify. Thanks for to me. Uh, any other will do sir. Please, uh, your, your contribution to the same question. Thank you very much. Um, well, the three things I think people of my age uh, are looking at now, some of uh, some people of my age are regretting uh, what they did not do when they were younger. Uh, the first, of course, is aging. There's nothing you can do about aging. You will become old. So when you, uh, you still have the possibility of uh, keeping something for your old age, if you didn't do it at that time, you are likely going to regret it as you become older. Because uh, like at my age, uh, hardly can you work as you used to do when uh, I was much younger. So you need to plan. And I tell people of my age group that there are seven P's of uh, success in life. That is proper planning and prayerful preparation prevent poor performance. So proper planning. 
and prayerful preparation prevent poor performance because you have to perform well when you are getting old and to think that uh, you will still remain young and be doing what you are doing when you are not younger is not possible. So, but if you plan well, uh, you will take care of your old age and you will enjoy it. Second thing that I know that is uh, happening around the place is uh, money issue. Either that you don't have enough, and uh, particularly, like I said, when you are growing old, you don't have the capacity anymore for multiple streams of income, and then you didn't have enough investment to take care of uh, your old age, then it becomes a problem, it becomes an issue. So those who are still younger, you must look into that. Now, unforgiveness is a, a very terrible issue uh, because there are so many people who offended you somewhere along the line and you have not forgiven them. And I think uh, the life of Joseph is very important. In our own home, we do what we call advanced forgiveness. I have decided to do that. Anybody who offends me, either my wife or anybody else, I forgive them in advance. That we, we practice it, uh, uh, advanced forgiveness. So like my wife and I, first of January of each year, we hold our hands and we say, whatever you do wrong to annoy me from 1st of January to 31st of December, I have forgiven you in advance. And he will he pledge the same to me because what he wanted is happiness. And the one, you are out of this world, you are out. So, and Jesus says, there's no marriage in heaven. So you must live every day of your marriage in happiness. And so that is uh, extremely very important. And then this of forgiveness. I learned a, a lot of lesson from uh, Joseph because any other human being, when he was in position to persecute his brothers who, who did wrong to him, he would have done so. But he did not, you know? And, and, and to become prime minister in Egypt, you have to go through what he went through. It wasn't uh, a joke, it wasn't uh, a, a pancake party. Uh, there are seven pigs also that uh, trailed his journey. First, he was uh, thrown into a pit, which means those of his brothers, even though they are, you, you see there are some people, family members and close friends, you think they are your friends, <laughs> but you never can know what they can do to you. And they will throw him into a pit. And then they brought him out and sold him into slavery. General Potiphar bought him, that's the second P. And uh, because Potiphar's wife was making eyes at him and he remained righteous, very important. And uh, he was sent to prison. And for 13 years, this young man was in prison. And, uh, you know, he didn't uh, hold it against them for an offense he did not commit. And then from there, he was able to interpret a dream for some two people. And one of them was his helper of destiny. And from prison, he went to the palace because he was meant, God had to be sure that the Pharaoh had to dream a dream which nobody else could interpret until Joseph got there. And then from the palace, he meant Pharaoh. That's the fifth uh, P. And Pharaoh, after he was able to interpret his dream, made him prime minister. Can you that the P in prime minister is number six P. And then from prime minister, uh, his brothers and uh, all of them who, who connived to, to more or less kill him, they now came looking for food. And when they realized this was their brother they wanted to kill, you know, they, they, they would have been praying that they had to open up and swallow them. But uh, he said to them that he came ahead of them to preserve life. So preservation of life is number seven. So he went through all the seven keys. And anybody who thinks, hey, Joseph is uh, doing very well, you have to go through what he went through. So with that, I, I always believe that there is no limit to forgiveness. People who hurt you, people who do evil, even your friends that you never thought, family members that can undo you, if they do it and God save you, you must forgive them and live in love with each other. That is my uh, advice. And God will continue to help us in Jesus' name. Amen. To give God the glory. Thank you very much, and thanks for the seven P's of uh, 
of the experience of uh, Joseph. And I'm sure for all of us here, we will have been able to situate ourselves in the midst of this uh, thing. So uh, Brother Nuga identified three, but I wrote to me, I mentioned one and spoke about it. And then, uh, so we have like seven things. You must, there was a one that, that, that relates with you uh, as you grow that. And also maybe it's also a feedback to the, uh, leadership of screening masculine. If these are the problems and things, challenges men are going through, maybe we should start to structure our programs to address these various issues. I mean, when Njaradi, uh, for example, says that uh, as you grow, that there are certain things you can't do, it's really that thing is personally paining me as a woman being because um, there, when I was young, I could do many things. I could do many things. But now it is spinning me. I don't know who to report the matter to. You know, I was studying the book of Job in the last couple of weeks. I said he wanted to go and report the matter to God. I personally wanted to go and report to God. I said, How can you wake up? You slept in the night. You didn't, you it's not as if in your dream, it's not as if you are you are walking or you are walking from Yanopadia to Lekki in your dream. You slept and you woke up and your leg is spinning you. You didn't do anything, you didn't offend God. It's not as if you committed fornication or adultery in the night. You sleep, you wake up, and your leg is just spinning you. You didn't do anything. And somebody said, how can that be fair? I, I didn't offend anybody now. But hey, it is what it is. Uh, your, your glasses. I remember many years I resisted not wearing glasses. Now you, you have to wear glasses. You, you, you don't want to wear glasses, but you can't see. I, I mean, how does that become part of your experience in life? You know, so I remember many years ago. So I have a, I, I, so if you notice, I have a whole jug of water in front of me. Many years ago, when I was much a younger preacher, I used to wonder where older men, when they preach, they have water beside them. And I used to wonder, I mean, people, I mean, they need to have anointing so that they can, I mean, why are they drinking water? They have just spoken for 30 minutes. They are men of God. I have a whole jug in front of me and I did not offend God. It is just the reality of life. Aging comes with challenges and we need to be ready for that. Okay, so we start to wind down now and I start to expect people to send in their questions now. So I'm going to go back to one of the questions uh, I'm going to, and this will be like the last call uh, for our panel members and then we'll switch to the questions from, from the members of the group of, of uh, that are participating. So Pastor Sam spoke about making your life count and as a team of this session. So I'm going to ask you, specific questions on how you think we can make our life count. Because if you're saying making your life count, it must be, it must be, it's, it is because it's possible, you know, if, if you know, uh, the team is making your life count. So that means you must make effort. It's a positive thing. You have to take action before you can make your life count. So if you don't take the action, then the life will not count. So we want to be more focused on sectors of human life now. So I'm going to start with Brother Rotimi. So how can a believer mix his life count as a believer? Now, so we're not talking with any, and so I'm a Christian, I'm born again. Uh, Mr. Adeshina, I did a said, uh, he said you can no longer start for 20 minutes down leaning. I didn't know, you, I, you know, when I, when I was younger, I used to teach in the university in Akura, I teach three hours straight, nothing did happen. I wouldn't drink water, I wouldn't stop. But now, except I swallowed the cell battery. Anyway, <laughs> so brought to me, how can a believer make his life count? A Christian, how do you make your life count? Okay. So a Christian can make his life count by simply living out the life of Christ. You know, and I'll give you an example. You know, we've spoken around forgiveness today, and it's very strong. So I'll, I'll use myself as an example, you know, about... Um, Maybe about 10, 12 years ago, I was, you know, chief technology officer for a telecom company. But shortly before I was appointed, I was an exec. And people brought papers for me. There was a department, they, they just matched to my, with my department. And they brought the paper for me to sign. And the money was like, in billions and i asked the manager what have you been looking at when your boss was there before he left for south africa why are you bringing this paper to me to sign up now this man had weeks before he left you didn't give him to sign now they brought your department to join mine you are asking me to sign this payment of over one year where are the contractors 
So they were unhappy, and then they went to, to report to the CTO then, a South African, and said all sorts about me. So the man said he should wait, that they should, he will send for me. They said, no, 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 no. They will go and settle with me. You know that I don't need to come. So weeks after, I got to hear what happened, as usual. And then months after, I became the, you know, the chief of the division. So the power to sack was in my hand. I had the budget. You know, so if I say you are going my division, you are going. So every time that we rationalize staff, these guys, they were having sleepless nights. They were so sure I was going to put their names on the exit list, you know. And each time they found out I didn't sack them. So the Muslim that was among them, a lady, who came to tell me what happened, came to meet me one day, said, ah, say, my God, this is Jesus, Jesus. It's very serious. So you have the gun now to kill all these people that, you know, rose against you, you know, went to speak against you, lied against you. And why are you keeping them? And I told her, I said, when God gave you power, you know, as a human being, is a temptation or a test because no one should have the kind of dominion that God has over others on any mortals. What am I saying? You know, for her, it was unimaginable that, you know, you have power to fire people who have lied against you. And year after year, for many, many years, you did not sack one of those people because they ever wrote something against you. So for me, as an individual, the most important thing for me is to live the life of Christ out. It may cost you some things, it may make you look stupid occasionally, but that's what gives me, you know, the that's 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 top of my list, you know, that's top on my list to make sure that I live out the life of Christ. Whether it's in your family, offense will come, whether it's in the church, offense will come, whether it's at workplace, offense will come. But what is most important to me is how I respond and that I respond in love, in forgiveness. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Very great uh, testimony, Brother um, uh, You know, Brother me is mentioning the fact that when we live as believers, according to the word of the Lord, then we make our life to count. You know, uh, because at the end of the day, like Jesus said, by their fruit, and the Bible says, when people see our good works, they will give glory to the Father. I mean, if we read all the people we read about in the Bible, it's, they were just living regular lives. The way they brought that letter to Baruch, the same way they would bring letter to us, the same way somebody will offer you sex, the same way somebody will offer you to join the call to get the promotion, the same way somebody will tell you to be to do something that looks pragmatic, right? But at the end of the day, <laughs> uh, I, I, it's, I mean, I know, I think one thing I like about the way it presented is just by you living the regular Christian life, nothing more than that. Just you obeying the word of the Lord, and you will start to make your life count to people. Thank you, Borutimi. Let me go back to Brother Naga to tell us. So, how can you make your life count as a male, as a man, either as a parent, as a husband, or as a family man? Now, please note the definition of family is white because you know there's a sense in which when we talk about family, everybody starts thinking about marriage. You are not you you, you not every, Jesus is not married, but he had family, he had mother, he had brother, he had sister. So, what can you do to make your life count as a family person? So, as a family person, could mean your brother, your husband, your sister, your parents. How can you make your life count as a family person? Um. So one of the ways that comes to mind now, which I feel is very important, is to provide proper leadership. It sounds very basic. We should go when the, when is old will never depart from it. It is a guarantee. It is a promise. It does not say oh the child might not or the, the child or the person. Everybody was true. I was once a child. So it does not mean the person might not have temptations. But the fact that you have trained them in the right way. There is always something that will draw them back to that way. So provide proper leadership. Um, and it starts from the cradle to every everything. Children, um, people around you, 
some children to even other people, other family members, and even people you mentor. They don't do what you say. They do what you do. So if you tell them, don't, they will do the exact thing that they see you do. Now, as children that we that we first are, and even to whether you're mentoring people, because when you meet people, their mind, they might be grown, but the fact that they are not at certain levels of learning, so they are still children at heart. Whatever you do forms them. So whether you do the right thing or the wrong thing, they are soaking it up. They are soaking it up like sponge. And that is how they will respond when they're in certain situations. So you know how to leave a legacy or to, you know how to leave to make your life count or to make other people around you better. You have to provide proper leadership. And in order to provide proper leadership, it means you have to be led properly. So when you provide that proper leadership, when you provide quality leadership, and quality leadership is not only, um, it's not just only um, when it's good or just... Um, Making people feel happy. It is calling them out when it's when they are doing wrong. Um, making them praising them when they are doing right. Basically building them up, building them up properly. When you provide proper leadership, you deposit a lot into the mindset of people that they are able to now know how to one thing I, I'm always thankful for is how my father raised us. He raised us in the God way. He and he, he yeah, he is not a perfect person, he made mistakes. And those are mistakes that he made. He put them to us and made, them under, made us understand, you can't do this. And he was real about it, so, making us understand the influence of those mistakes on his life. And when we, are, when we are faced with certain situations, we see that, okay, I can do this. I should not do this. I should not do that. And even as grown-ups now, I can still hear many of the things my father told me when I was, I was younger, when I was going to school. Don't do this. Do that. Don't be this. Know the family you are from. So I, I, when we provide good leadership, when we provide proper leadership, we deposit amazing qualities into people that grow into massive character trees that are able to pro uh, protect and guide them in the day that danger will come, because danger will definitely come. Thank you very much, sir. Thanks, uh... Thanks, Brother Naga. We we'll talked about when we model the right behaviors is a, is a great way. You know, as I was just speaking, I was just thinking about some of the things, values my dad also projected for me and some of the things the great men on this call have done. So very important. We lead properly if you want to make a life count as a family person. And you don't have to be a father to lead properly. You can just be a good senior brother or you can just be a good uncle. I mean, come and think about it. If you ask all the men here, and if you can, if you want to share this, many of the bad behaviors you learned when you were young did not come from outsiders. They came from family members, most likely brothers or uncles. Whether it's the person that gave you your first cigarette or the person that gave you your, introduced you, that taught you how to toast bib, or the person that taught you how to steal or the person that taught you how to escape from the house. If you, if you say it didn't happen to you, then maybe your own brothers and uncles are angels. But most likely it's those people that, made gave you those bad habits but but you could also be the person that make life to count thank you brother Naga. so let me come to engineer the world and please uh, what do you think we can do to make our life count in society and in business well thank you very much it's a very interesting question um for some of you who do not know my background um, I came out of uh, a Muslim home and uh, I spent uh, quite a number of years in Arabic school. And so by the time I got to college, well, uh, let me just give you a little bit. I think I have one more minute to add to it. Um, in my youth, I, I, I was wondering why some people will go to church on Sunday with their children and my parents would take me to the mosque. On, on Fridays. And as I was growing up, I was thinking, are there two gods, one to be served on Sunday and the other one on Friday? When it was time to go to primary school, it was very easy because I was sent to a Saruddin primary school that was in our town. My other colleagues in the neighborhood were sent to St. Andrew's primary school. 12 years down the line, we were out of, uh, I mean, six years down the line, we were out of primary school, and we had to go to college. My colleagues were sent to St. John College, near Church Grammar School. But there was no Muslim college in my town. 
and my father will not send me to a Christian school. So what to do? But thank God, the very year I was born, the elders in the community decided to set up a college. Uh, I think they did it because of me. Because about 80% of them were stuck in literates, but it just occurred to them they needed a college there. And my father said, okay, this one, although it's not a Muslim college, but this is not a Christian college. So he allowed me on the condition that I was exempted from Bible religious knowledge. So each time they were doing their day, I will walk out of the class. And uh, one day, I uh, were writing an examination and I walked out of that class. I sat on a wooden chair under a tree somewhere. The principal of the college drove in to pray with us in the hall. And uh, then after we left our class, he decided to go back home for his breakfast because one way or the other, heavens make sure that his cook steward woke up late and his, his breakfast was not ready. Instead of going back in his car, he decided to exercise himself by walking. And he saw me and he said, young man, what are you doing outside? The others are writing an examination. I said, yes, sir. The subject this morning is Bible, religious knowledge, and I have nothing to do with Bible. And the principal asked me a question. He said, do you study English language? I said, yes, sir. He said, are you British? I said, no, sir. He said, yeah, you don't have to be a Christian to study BRUT. You just take it as a subject. He led me to the classroom and gave me the question paper. I said, write the exam. Can you imagine somebody who has never been to church, has never taught the Bible, has never done it, is that right? And in those days, nobody could argue with a school teacher not to talk of a school principal. So they gave me the question, I look at it. First question, righteous knows on the following, Abraham, Pharaoh. And I look at it, who is Abraham? But in the Quran, there's an Abi Ibrahim. And the name, uh, Sintonaya, I said, maybe this is something. So I wrote uh, all I knew in the Quran about Anabi Ibrahim, uh, the husband of Ega, the father of Ishmael. It was Ishmael he wanted to slaughter and God gave him a ram. And we are still celebrating the Leia festival to mark that occasion up to now. So I wrote all this. And uh, at the bottom of my paper, I said, I hope this Abraham is the same person as Ibrahim. If he's not, I've tried my best. I submitted my paper. A week later, when the result came out, some of the Christian students scored below 50%, and I scored 58%. I said, wow, so this object must be very simple. So that day, I went to the school bookshop and bought myself the, my first Bible. And I opened up to St. Uh, uh, I think it was John, yeah, St. John Gospel. And it was saying, in the beginning was the world. And the word was with God, and the word was God. It was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was nothing made that was made. That this word became flesh and lived a moment. He came to His own, His own knew Him not. But to them that knew Him, He gave the power to be called the children of God. I said, ah, God has children. We are supposed to be slaves of God. And down the line, He said, God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believed in Him, shall not perish, but have everlasting life. I said, eh, eh. So God has. Then down the line, Jesus himself, this son of God, was boasting. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father except to me. I said, ah, <laughs> really now? How can you say you are the only one? What of Muslim? What of other religion? So next Sunday, I decided to go to the chapel to ask the chaplain some questions. Let them explain. But when I got to the chapel, what I had was even more serious than the questions I brought to him. And uh, he said why Jesus was preaching. Uh, blind people uh, were seen, the lame was walking, and, and a man called uh, Nicodemus uh, went to meet Jesus at night and said, nobody can do this thing you are doing except God is with him. And Jesus said to me, except a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus said to how can a man be born again? Will he have to go back into his uh, mother's womb and be born again? Jesus said, he who is born of the flesh is flesh, but he who is born of the spirit is spirit. I left the chapel without asking the questions I brought there. And I was wondering, how can a person be born again? As I got out, I saw an elderly man, a friend of my father, who greeted. Immediately, the man was a Muslim. He went to tell my father, I said, I tell you, your son is already going to church and the hell was let loose. And my father invited me. Just to call the long story short, 
uh, my father then decided he was able to <coughs> excuse me, pay my school fees. So that night, I knelt down by my bed and I said, Lord Jesus, you know, I don't know you very much. I'm just trying to know you now. I know you perform miracles. And now my education is about to be aborted because they are sending debtors out of school and my father will not pay my school fees. I should go to my father in heaven, you know? And uh, I said, so pay my school fees today. If you can pay it today, it will be a miracle. I can assure you, I will follow you for the rest of my life. I didn't know I was cutting a covenant. And the whole heaven went to market to work for me. Before we close that day, the principal called me and informed me that I have been awarded Western Government Scholarship. Praise the Lord. And that my school fees will be paid 100%. And even went more than that. That the one I had paid for two years before that day will be refunded. And that I will be paid pocket money every month. And each time the teachers are going to the bus house office to collect their monthly salary, I should go there and collect my pocket money. Can you imagine? So the whole thing turned around. And I came back and said, Jesus, you have played your part. I will play my part. The fact that I'm talking to you this evening is a confirmation that I'm still playing my part of the covenant. When I got admitted to university, parents still refused to pay. They said, are you now back to Islam? And I said, no, because in my final year, I, the Lord fell on me to become the president of the student Christian movement. So I came in as the assistant chief imam, and five years down the line, I was the president of the student Christian movement. And God paid my school fees all through, you know? So uh, God will always make a way where there seems to, to be no way. The point I am trying to make is now, Although in my family, as at that time, there was no Christian. But today, about 80% of my family members are Christians. They all now know Jesus. And uh, even the old ones, before they died, uh, knew Jesus. Praise the Lord. And then the Holy Spirit asked me to do something. And in 2000, I was helping people to start business. And, to, and then he said I to set up a school uh, to raise what premiums? And I said, who is a what premium? And he said, a what premium is an entrepreneur that does its enterprise according to the word of God. So by 2007, I set up this school. I call it a school for business success. And everybody that has been coming to that school, I think we cannot count thousands of people that have gone through that school and they are setting up their businesses and doing the right thing without corruption, without, you know, teaching them about integrity of business, Holy Spirit as their senior business partner, and everything has been working out. I believe that to that work one is doing in discipleship, and in that school, God has, uh, has been helping me. And up to today, the school is still alive, and we we'll even go on, the, I think by next Saturday, we will be on the air again, uh, where I choose topic to assist uh, entrepreneurs to work according to the work of God. Praise the Lord. And I think that is the area of uh, bringing men into the kingdom of God, businessmen doing their business according to the word of God. I think that is what I want to be remembered for. Thank you very much. Oh, wow. Thank you, Engineer Lady. Uh, what, what an amazing testimony. Uh, there are quite a lot. Somebody wrote in the group on this group chat and said that if, the, if Engineer Lady will lose. The testimony is the only thing I got in this program. I'm blessed. Thanks for writing that. But it's also important to realize that various dimensions to what NGL you mentioned, various dimensions. And that's why I allowed him to explain that much. You know, you know, the theme of this program is always good for us to go back to. I, I mean, every time I invite, I get invited to, I always try to remember people that remind people that, you know, God put in the hearts of the organizers a vision and the vision in this program is making your life count. And then he told them to bring these speakers to come and talk about it. That two speakers have an obligation to always remember what is the vision the people invited you to do, you know? And that is what this his testimony has talked about. You know, my question was, how can you make your life count? So he has described how he has made his own life count, starting the school, being an example, being a president. At the same time, he has also mentioned how that principal made his life count. You remember in this story, in this testimony, this testimony started with who? The testimony started with the principal that saw him outside and took him and said he should go and write the exam. That, test, that singular action by that man 
is part of how to make your life count. And you know, there is no way in the world where Engineer Lady Wallu will be called to mention to share his testimony that he will not mention the name of that man. Do you understand? And that is the whole idea of this making our life count. And you know, we're talking about in business, in the workplace. So you are a doctor, you are an engineer, you are a lawyer. You can also be that principal to somebody else. The same way this principal was somebody else is this. Don't also forget that he said he got a scholarship. Some government official sat down somewhere and decided to give scholarships, uh, give scholarship to him. Those ones are also making their life count. It's very, very important because sometimes you ask yourself, so what is this life? All of us will not have a picture like Pastor Sam. I mean, not all of us will not have it, but most of us will not have it. The way God does it is just certain percentages that do that. But all of us can be that principal in the various way we are in. I know as I was sharing this, I just thought about myself. I mean, the way I was also born a Muslim. My Muslim is Abdul Razak, right? Interesting, in my own case, my great-grandfather brought Islam to Ondola. The first Muslim in my hometown, Ondo, is my great-grandfather. He brought Islam to my hometown. So it, our family is not just an Islamic family. It's a family where the legacy is the legacy of bringing Islam there. I you know, I also started going to Quranic school and then going to do, I was the executive of Muslim Success Society and things like that. I know when he was talking about I just I was just remembering this. I, every World Teachers Day in October, I always write about someone. It was my physics teacher. It was my form four. And I went to sign to take a subject. I still remember the man's name. The man's name is Mr. Okon Emenwe. That was the first person that made me think about becoming a Christian. And you know, he signed my course and said, okay, I can take his class. I should come and start from next week. And as I was about to turn, he just asked me, he said, Razak, I said, yes, sir. He said, why are you a Muslim? So I looked at him. This was my physics teacher. He was supposed to teach me about Pythagoras and things like that. So I turned to him and I said, sir, he said, yeah, why are you a Muslim? I said, yeah, I'm a Muslim because my parents are Muslim. So he said, oh, wow, interesting response. So he now asked me, so if your parents were worshiping idols, would you be worshiping idols? I said, I can't, I don't know. He said, so you can't choose a religion because that's what your parents did. Why don't you think about becoming a Christian? And he said, bye-bye. Uh, that's, that's the first time anybody appealed to me to become a Christian. Actually, that is the reason why I became a Christian. It was physics I went to look for. I did not know how Jesus entered physics class. Now, it's that man, that my story is, my life story changed on account of that, that physics teacher who decided to make his life count in that context. And it's very, very important. All of us have an opportunity to make a life count. There's a question from Bumi Oluwashe, brother Bumi. He said, when one has a vision and is struggling to meet up financially, what can you do? So somebody has a vision, but he's struggling financially to me. What can you do? Borrow to me in two minutes. Please help us with that question. I have a vision. I need money for the vision. I can't meet it up today. What do I do? Borrow to me. Are you there? Okay. Thank you. So, you know, so I will answer in the words of uh, Dr. Beche, you know, he said, if you put money ahead of knowledge, you will use your money to get experience. So he advised, and I found it to be true, that you should always put money behind knowledge. Then you stand a chance to succeed. So if you have a vision that requires money, like many people do from time to time, there are a few ways to approach it. The first one, can you save? You know, I cannot overemphasize <laughs> the power of savings. A preacher said, God has given you two hands, one to eat and one to keep, except you don't know the use. So can you save up? Two, can you increase your skill to earn more? You know, I, I, I'll give you a practical example. There was a time I, I got a job as an optical engineer and it was my first time, you know. I went to look for my junior, somebody I pastored on campus. 
He was my junior by two or three years, but he was already, he was the only one I knew who had the closest key in optical telecommunication at that time, many, many years ago. Every time I finish first service or second service in Daystar, I will run, drive myself to his house in Maryland. He was teaching me the bits and pieces that he knew, and that helped me to stabilize on that job. So can you improve your skill to earn more? Because I earn more, you know, by just performing on that, on that job. Thirdly, have you developed a social capital for yourself? You know, when you borrow 10,000 from people and you pay back 20,000 and you pay back, you don't know what you are doing to yourself. You are building a good name for yourself. I actually wrote an article on that many, a few years ago, you know, building a good name for yourself. So if you have a good name, you know, so this is brought your me here now. You know, when my sister was in banking, I didn't even need to speak with him. You know, he would just call my sister, Sister Lola. This is somebody that is like 10 years younger. Sister Lola, share a need. You don't need the deposits in your, in your bank. And he will give my sister money. I didn't even have to put money. My sister didn't even have to ask him. So if you built up a good name for yourself also, you know, you can, always speak to people if you have a plan that is credible, that, that has value in it, and people will be willing to invest. And you know, my last comment on this would be start small. I have learned that you know, the, the best way to test all of my hypothesis is to start small. So if you put in money that won't make you cry, and you find that you are making progress, then you can, you can scale. So, but money is not always going to be the biggest deal, in my opinion. The first thing is that, do you really have a plan? Do you know what you are trying to do? Or everything is just in your head? You know, the scriptures say, right division, make it clear, so that either reads it, can run with it, you know? So, so this vision of yours, you know, have you written it down? Is there a plan, a credible plan behind it? Have you been, has it been tested, you know, under different scenarios? And then can you save up? You know, don't go and borrow money. I beg you by the message of God. I cannot tell you how many people have ruined their life, borrowing money for microfinance, for long-term projects. You know, you can't make it at 5% per month. If, if you are going to understand numbers, you know, because even if you are going to ask people, you know, to give you money or to support, the first one to find how much of your own money has gone into it, you know. So if I start hearing you talking about, I mean, Brotoye will be laughing if he's on this call now. If I start hearing somebody I don't know with his own 10 million, start talking about 500 million. 1 billion, 700 million, I'll just carry my Bible and leave. You know, I won't even wait for you to finish. You know, I will carry my Bible and just, you know, there are people who they like to call me big numbers. You don't have 1 million of your own money, but you're always looking for other people's money of 500 million, 1 billion, I will carry my Bible and leave the room, you know? So the question is, do you understand numbers? Are you able to present to people a plan that is credible, that is realistic, that is sustainable, you know? And if you are able to do all that, more often than not, you'll be able to, to fund, you know, your vision. I mean, that's, those are practical steps I would recommend for you, you know, and it's index on a guy, you know, write the vision, make it plain, so that he that reads it can run with it. Thank you. Thank you, Borosine. Thanks, uh, thanks for that for that response. Uh, write the vision, make it clear. Either Dridi can run with it. And you know, if we connect back to Pastor Sam's earlier message, where he talked about have a vision, uh, write it down. So maybe a dimension of writing that is speaking it. You know, Pastor Sam said the second thing we should do after we have a vision is to write it, which is make it plain, so that others can see it and run away, run with it. And that's where the question of okay, who can be motivated? 
you know, and you know, Exalogo has also said that we should think about our visions and think whether they are fundable. Can we get people to fund this vision we have? Can we get people to invest? But Otimi has also mentioned, can we start small? Can we start to do these things gradually? Um, thanks, Brother Otimi. I mean, I hope we answer that question. So I'm going to come to Brother Nuga. Uh, Brother Nuga, uh, there's somebody that is asking a question about performance. I know Brother Rutmi was the one that raised the issue, but I wanted to talk about it. You know, when I was young, when I was young, we used to hear about some things that you now see on the streets. I mean, uh, you, uh, talking about performance, for example, sex performance enhancing products. I mean, when I was young, I used to wear what yeah. they call brand tashi. I never <laughs> saw it. I didn't know where they sell it. You know, you, you hear it, but today yeah. on the streets, I want to buy, I went to buy gas at uh, the filling station near Sheraton, um, Mubalaji Bank, Antonia, and there was this man yeah. that walked towards me and says, uh, this thing, this performance issue. So I want to talk, somebody is saying that, okay, what are we, this performance thing, you are trying your best and the performance is not performing. Do you want to start to use Burantashi to enhance your performance in the sake of sex? Or you are doing your best to perform as a husband or as a wife, and people are not recognizing what you are doing, or the performance is not enough. What do you do? Do you do a like double your zoo, or do you start to bend corners? Or what do you do if the performance is not performing? Ronuga. I would, um, so we're talking about performance generally now. Yes, sir. All right. So the the first the first thing, just the way you said it, is are you actually trying your best? That's the first that's the first thing. Are you actually doing when it comes to bringing things to the table? Is that actually all you can do? And in a case where that is all, one thing uh, um, I've learned evaluate yourself honestly. What are the things that you need to stop doing? What are the things you need to learn? Because many times in our lives, we get to a point where we just get to a point where we don't want to add, we don't want to learn. We feel like where we are is is all of it. But what helps people is, what helps us, what helps me is getting to that point where, you know, I need to reevaluate re re myself. I need to and become a new person. It's like, it's like a tree. There's times where the leaves are green. There's times where it dies. There's times where it comes afresh. So I feel we need to be able as people to to tell ourselves the truth that okay we need to become we need to learn and new we need to put the old away and learn new things and we, so if it is things like uh, hello can you still hear me because my my headset went off so we need to we need to get to that point where we reevaluate ourselves totally that is total reevaluation and we know that what i am doing right now is not enough to get me to where i am for example in business you might know old things you might know um certain principles of before and they used to work before but now where we are is not working anymore you need to tell yourself the truth that this is not working anymore because of you need to be preservation for the future you must tell yourself and you must start to learn even though sometimes to make you less than you are in quotes just for example you are in a business field and the knowledge you have is outdated and you need to go and relearn. You might feel like, oh no, at this level, at this level that I am, I shouldn't be going back. But that time you will use to go back. Let's say it's the year you used to go back. Whether you do that going back or not, that year is going to pass. You are going to add that age. You're going to be older. Whether you're going, like for some of my friends that says, oh, I don't, I don't want to go back to school, but they need it. But like whether you go back or not, that one year, that two years is going to pass. You're still going to be older. But And if, if you do it, you have the knowledge. If you don't do it, you remain at this point. So we need to be, basically tell ourselves the truth. Because most times, we don't like to tell ourselves the truth. We like to gas ourselves up that, oh, we are all right. We are good. But with everything, it can't, so with every field, it's different. The energy is different. But things that have to do with family, is different from things that have to do with your career or things that have to do with your education. But for whatever field it is, you must look at it critically. And, and be truthful about it and do what needs to be done. So when we now tell ourselves the truth, sometimes execution now becomes a problem. We don't know how to tell ourselves how to now do it, but we must hold ourselves accountable enough to get it done because the results our life will start to have when we do what we, what we are supposed to do will be so massive that it's sometimes the, the difference is 10x times 10 of what 
we are, what we were before. So I feel the process, evaluate yourself, tell yourself the hard truths, outline what you need to do and actually be, be, should be loving enough to yourself and your future self to do those things. Thank you very much, yes, Bruno. So I, I think, I think. Thanks, Bruno. I, I just quickly call I on. I can't hear you, you know. Bye. No, no. Sorry, Engineer Ladewonu, thanks. Uh, I, I just want you to add to this conversation because yes. Brother Nuga has talked about how to deal with performance issues. Well, you know, when you are making your own top three challenge, you are talked about, you can't do some things you used to do again. So what do you do? And you know, the rate at which we hear of stories of old men who have to try to show up, to try to perform and make sure that younger people feel their sister. So how, what, what, what do you think somebody can do when the performance is not enough? What do you think one can do What when the performance is, you are being taxed to overperform? Uh, Angel, what do you say? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, permit me to, first of all, go one step uh, backwards to talk about this uh, starting business with little or no capital. Because this is one thing that keeps coming up in our School for Business Success, and I'm sure that the listeners will benefit a lot from this. There are many businesses you can go into without necessarily having capital. Uh, for example, there is what is called contract manufacturing. A lot of the bottled water you see on the street, not all the people have uh, machines to treat water and bottle them. They just go to a company that already has the machinery and is producing water. They reach agreement with them. They will help them to fill their own bottle and then all they need to do is put their own label, the label of their company. And then they, they start selling, you see? And as they are selling, they are paying some money to the owner of the machinery. And the owner of the machinery will be very happy to do that because uh, they will have borrowed money from the bank. And uh, now you are helping with the marketing and uh, you are paying back for a service. And with that one, they can write off very quickly is a uh, loan in the bank. And for somebody who is doing this uh, contract manufacturing, after, uh, within one, two, three years, he had enough money to buy his own machinery without going to the bank to go and borrow money. So contract manufacturing is one way of doing business without necessarily going to bank to borrow. Another one is franchising. You go to a company that is doing something which you love to do. Maybe I'll just make an example. One guy who came to uh, our school, he, he, he went, he got a, a, an apartment in a new estate. And one day he collected all his dirty clothes, wanted to go and uh, drag it them. And there was none in that estate. So he said, oh, this is business because there's a need here. So he went, but he has no money to buy laundry machinery. So he went to town and found a very good laundry company. And he signed a franchise with him. And he will collect all the dirty clothes in the estate. That's his work. They will take them to this uh, company. They will launder and dry clean the clothes, and then they will bring it back to. He was using his apartment as the uh, <laughs> as the collection point, and then he will give it back to the owners, and they will pay him twenty five percent of the income. After two years, he made enough money to set up his own uh, laundry business. I mean, uh, yeah, laundry business. So that is franchising. You can do it uh, in many places. Uh, another one, of course. You know, cash flow is more important than profit. Profit is uh, <laughs> just on paper. If you are not getting your receivables, people who are bought from you, they are not paying you. You cannot spend the money that has not come into your account, even though they say you make profit. You can't pay your workers, you can't buy raw materials if the cash has not come in. You're still in receivable. So when you do business, you have to be sure that you get uh, positive cash flow. If not, the, that is one of the reasons that many companies uh, die because they just are looking for profit. And profit alone is not the one that keeps the company going. Positive cash flow is more important. Uh, <clears throat> but more important of all this is that uh, the Holy Spirit, if you make him your senior business partner, all right, he will give you revelation. 
because when you are doing your business plan, uh, you depend on information from your managers, maybe, but information is basically depending on facts of things that happened in the past. But Holy Spirit revelation gives you the truth of what will happen in the future. So if you partner closely with the Holy Spirit, it will direct you the way to go. I just tell you this short story. I, I wanted to introduce certain machineries to Nigeria. And uh, I, I brought the machines from Holland. I went all over the place, uh, people that I think who need them. And they said, yes, 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 we need them. But when I told them the amount of money, how much they, they just laugh at me. They, how do you think we can get money to buy this kind of a thing? So one day I, I knelt down in my room and I said, Lord, you directed me, I told you before I went for this machine. So what shall I do? You know, one night I saw a man was walking beside me along Broad Street. And then we entered the building. And then we went to the first floor, a second floor. And then he opened a door on my right hand side. And he said, your helper of destiny. Who? And I wanted to turn around to say, what's the name of the person? This one who was leading me disappeared. I didn't see him. Then I turned around and I found I was in my bed. Ah, I said, so this is a dream or a vision. Then I dressed up. I went to that building because I knew the building. And then as I got close to that building, one spirit was telling me, <laughs> you are going to put yourself to shame. When you get to that building, who do you say you're asking for? Do you have uh, an appointment with anybody? And I didn't have anybody's name, no appointment. He said, what are you going to tell the receptionist? Then I said to myself, God will make a way where there seems to be no way. I went there anyway. By the time I got there, the receptionist said, told me later that he actually went to the toilet just a few minutes before I got there. And I look at my right hand and I saw director for the Department of Agriculture. Say, hey, this is the department that will need this type of machine. I knocked the door, the man said, come in. I went in, he offered me a seat. And then I said, what can I do for you, gentlemen? And of course, that was the question I have been asked, <laughs> looking for. For three months, I was traveling to Potaco, to Calabar, where they had uh, this uh, plantation that needed this equipment. I gave him the brochures. And uh, you know, those who cut the long story short, this man looked at me <clears throat> and said, it looks like you have a spy in my office. I said, what do you mean, sir? He said, what you are telling me now is exactly what my technical team has been discussing here. How to get this type of machinery to help the people in the, in the plantations in Nigeria. I said, hey. So uh, he said, I should go and bring the, you know, and those were the days when there was no corruption. He didn't ask for a couple. He said, just bring me the package, which I did. And this led to the award I was thinking of selling one, but he, they, they gave me a contract for 12 units at a time, 12. They just multiplied my unit price by 12, and they did not even ask for quantity discounts. Can you imagine? And then I came back to thank the Holy Spirit for this wonderful thing. He says to me, from now on, when you rely on me, your uh, struggling is over. Just depend on my revelation, and that will be successful for you. Then he asked me a few questions. He said, why did Jesus have 12 disciples? I said, I didn't know. <laughs> then he said, when Jesus fed 5,000 people with uh, uh, two loaves and three fishes or something, he said, how many baskets did they remove? I said, 12. He said, why? Why was it 12? I said, I didn't know. He said, how many months make a year? I said, 12. He said, why 12? Why not a round figure of 10 or something? I said, I didn't know. Then he said, this contract of 12 units was awarded to you so that you would know that it was packaged from heaven. He said, 12 has a special meaning in heaven. Praise the Lord. So, this is, uh, so since that time, I, <laughs> if uh, the salary was uh, successful, he said, we now have a group of companies. It's not my, <laughs> it's not because I'm intelligent, it's not because of my qualification, it's that I know who to go to. And that is one reason I'm happy I'm talking on this platform. Please, the day of struggling is over. Rely on the Holy Spirit to direct you. Information doesn't work anymore. What works now is revelation. It gives you competitive advantage over all the others who don't know Christ. If you are born again and you are not using the power of the Holy Spirit, you are just not changing yourself. I depend on him completely. And, uh, and I thank God for it. I'm 77, over 77 years old. I'm still strong and healthy. 
uh, the last 40 years, I have not slept one night in any hospital. <laughs> God, God is taking care. And I just tell him, I'm doing your work. Just take care of me. And he's doing that. Praise the Lord. And I, <laughs> I just pray that uh, uh, the glory goes to God. And I believe that God will do exactly the same for you. Your business will grow. And, and, and the Holy Spirit will guide you. He said, I'm the Lord your God who teaches you to profit and leads you the way you should go. He said, your ears will hear a word saying, this is the way walk in it. And that is what you will be doing. Don't struggle. Eh? I don't say don't work hard. Though. Work hard is different from struggling. When you are struggling, you don't know where you are going. You just, but let the Holy Spirit lead you. And the result will be outstanding. God bless you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Engineer Ladevon. Thank you so very much. I rely on the Holy Spirit making me a senior partner. Okay, so last words, and then uh, Rosibo will make a comment around uh, the issue about performance and sex and things like that. But Rosibo, please, you have the floor, and that will also be your last words. Okay, so I, you know, when you mentioned about sexual enhancements, you know, medication many years ago, you know, and I'm saying because we are all men here. You know, I have opportunity to see and, and one of the biggest e-commerce in Nigeria's data. And what was shocking to me that when I thought food was going to be the most selling item on that platform, it was not. It was actually sex toys, you know, and sex-related items. I, you know, I sorted the data. I, I did all of all sorts with that data and it was mind blowing for me that because of the privacy that people enjoy, you know, being able to order from their phones and their parts and all that and it gets delivered without anybody knowing what, you know, what they use, you know. So I'm saying this to us and, you know, when I see a trend out there, I do not lie to myself that, you know, it doesn't occur in church, you know. And so, if you are dealing with performance issue as a man, go and see a doctor. Don't do substance abuse, please. And many of the things for those who have watched, you know, many of us did not have the, the some of us did not have the, the burden of watching, you know, funny films growing up, you know, so we may be scared. We may be scared of some, of some pressure, but for those who have, you know, baggages, you know, go for counseling. Many of the things you watch are not real. There were things done, you know, under the influence of alcohol and, and drugs to, to stimulate your mind in a particular direction. So I'm saying this because it's, it's something that can waste life, you know, can leave you poorer, you know, and can, can damage your, your sense of work, you know. Thank you very much, and I'm I'm grateful to the leadership of Street Primary School and and the pastor in charge of the men's group, Pastor Boye, you know, for for giving me the opportunity to share my thoughts. Thank you, good evening. Thank you, Boru, to me. Thanks so much for for that. Uh, I mean, you know, yes, use data to show that. I mean, men, if we need medical help, please uh, seek medical help, whether it's for sexual performance, and don't let your life be stranded by that. Uh, let me call Brother Nuga to give us his last word. Brother Nuga. Brother Nuga, are you there? I think Brother Nuga left. Can I? No, it, it, uh, it's there. It's muted. Brother Nuga, you are muted. Can you unmute yourself, sir? All right. All right. So thank you. I've, so I've, in this time frame of this, I've learned so much from the elders that are here. I'm so blessed to have been called on this panel. When they were calling the names, and they called, the, when they called me first, I'm like, oh, yeah, cool. When they started calling the other people, are calling all their achievements. I was like, ah, ah. I'm having to speak with these people. But it has been amazing. I've learned so much. I'm grateful to the Strictly Masculine team for considering and for bringing me on. I'm very, very, very thankful. And I've learned so much here that I can go on to pass on to others about um, making their lives count. And also, one other thing that I've learned, which is amazing, is how massive this community is. Over 
over over 400 people joined this meeting and that is massive so it's something i'm happy about so i'm very thankful i'm very thankful thanks to everyone thanks for listening and thanks for having me Thank you, Brother Aga. Thank you for your contribution. Uh, when you said what everybody has achieved, you know, um, it's there's a Yoruba proverb that uh, the best way to develop the capacity of elephants to blow horns is for them, the young elephants, to be blowing horns with the old elephants. That when the old elephants are blowing horns and they say, when is the time of the young elephant, let them blow their own, they will blow rubbish. So the Yoruba philosophy is that two of you must blow together. And so I think I, we must commend the wisdom of the leaders of Strictly Masculine for this cross-generational panel that takes people from various age groups and all of us are blowing horns. I know in the process, all of us are learning. Uh, you know, there's what they call mentoring. We talk about mentoring a lot in church, but there's also what is called reverse mentoring where I will be able to learn from somebody younger than I. Uh, I think one of the errors we make is we emphasize mentoring a lot, but we don't emphasize the first reverse mentoring. So that's where you eventually realize that pastors grow old with time. So when a pastor starts a church many years, after many years, the members of the church that we see him as their pastor will be the people in his age group. So the younger people will not see him as their pastor. Like one young girl told my friend, who is a pastor that, uh, so the, my pastor told the young girl that, uh, you know, I, 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 as a pastor in the church, and the girl said, no, you're not a pastor in our church. You are a pastor in the adult church. My Sunday school teacher is our pastor in our whole church. But that pastor could have been mentored by his son to be able to relate because the person cannot even remember what, what value he has there. So. I need to bring this to a close. I want to thank everybody who has been on this panel. Let me thank Engineer Ladi Wolu. Like I said, I call him Engineer Ladi Wolu because it is not going to be right for me to call him brother or mister. He's engineer, which is the you know, you. engineer. You can thank use you very, very much. I'm uh, yes. glad to be part of this uh, panel. Uh, thank you, sir. I, hope, and... uh, I look forward to something like that again in the near future. Thank you. Ah, no. That one is sure, sir. You can be sure that will happen. You dropped some bars that will make a lot of that made a lot of difference. Thank you, sir. Let me yeah. thank Brother Rutimi Aborisha Day for his for all the contributions and all this. Now, Brother Rutimi, I can't take you for granted. Thank you very much. You really made a difference. I celebrate and I honor you. And uh, like I said, Brother Rutimi and I have been together for such a long time. So thank you, Brother Rutimi. And then Brother Naga. Brother Naga is about the person I didn't know so well before now. I mean, but we've started a relationship and I enjoyed listening to you. I also, I was also very excited when you talked about when they read your profile and your background in the theater hat. I, I'm a firm believer that culture is a very strong tool. You know, so when you are talking about toxic mas mas masculinity, I wanted to say it is in the hands of you people in media, in drama, in music, you are the ones that make men feel one kind. So bro, Nuka, I'm giving you a personal assignment. You have to start to use your drama, your script, your song, to show this positive light of masculinity. Let them start showing men to be people like uh, Fade Yoluru, men that are horrible, like uh, Igwe that kill people, men that the role of culture has been modified by the art and, and it's not helped us for us to have there. So Bronaga, assignment for you. I will follow up with you, no for my hand. So let me also thank the leadership of uh, Script Masculine and also thank Pastor Sam. You know, Pastor Sam was the one that gave us a context for this conversation. We only expanded the one say, like uh, Paul wrote, uh, Paul planted Apollo waters, God gave the increase. So Pastor Sam, you watered, you planted, we are watering. We believe that we watered alongside what you had at the bottom of your, of your heart and uh, it, it helped us at the end of that. And everyone that has been there, they're still over uh 250 people on the call thank you for staying to us first i'm going to hand it over to the moderator to take it on from here thank you strictly masculine leadership for allowing me to do this it's been a great pleasure and i i believe that it's for the value adding experience let me turn it over to brother you come thank you very much prof thank you thank you thank you and so since um prof had um, said the word of thank you to all our panelists i think it's only appropriate for me to appreciate prof too Thank you very much, um, Brother Yomi Fawaimi. It's always a pleasure listening to you. Thank you for insight. Thank you for moderating excellently well. And thank you for to everyone on this call still. And so we, I just want to quickly mention a few things that have been said earlier by the president of Strictly Masculine and speaking to the fact that Strictly Masculine is a community of men in this time. And we've dropped in the link for the 
men's lounge for the prayer room and a phone number where you can send messages into to us and then we will reach out to you and get back to you. We'll tell you more about how you can be part and parcel of um, what we do in Strictly Masculine. The only way I can describe this meeting so far is wow, wow, wow. I don't know how many people like me, uh, let, me see, let me see a show in, in, in the chat room who feel like we should do Making Your Life Count 2.0. Seems like we, could, we should do that next week, Saturday. Making your life count 2.0. Wonderful, wonderful insight, fantastic insight. Royal me took a verse now, which I will write on as we go to the next item. Paul planted, Apollo watered, God added the increase. And then we had from Engineer Ladiwell. I don't even know how to describe the session with Engineer Ladiwell. The formation doesn't work. The curriculum has said, um, the answer to the curriculum has changed. Is depending on revelation and making the Holy Spirit a senior partner in the equation of life and making our life count. I'll quickly want to invite our pastor, Pastor Boye Oluyede, for a time of prophetic declaration. Let's make welcome Pastor Boye Oluyede. Let's give him an E version of a fantastic welcome. Thank you, Ragwinga. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for staying with us up till this time. It's been, uh, it's been, it's been, um, it's been an encouraging, inspiring session. Um, I don't know about you. I just, I just, I just feel excited in my in my spirit that some, some seeds have been dropped and these seeds are going to germinate. They are going to germinate uh, just, just like scripture makes us to understand that uh, hearing is my father glorified that you bear fruits and your fruits abide. Uh, so we trust God that the fruit of this session today uh, will will germinate and it will abide in the mighty name of Jesus. Can you hear me? Very well, sir. Clear and loud. Oh, okay, because my assistant um, is showing like I'm frozen. Okay, if you can hear me. Um, I just need a confirmation if you can hear me, so I can just manage to. We, we, we can hear you, sir. Okay. The video not clear, but we can hear you, sir. Yeah, hearing you okay now, clear. Oh, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. So, uh, once again, let me appreciate uh, Brakunle Shile, our our strictly masculine head, for the amazing job that he is doing. Uh, we've received so much today, from our senior pastor to the panelists. Um, and I trust God that as we live here, the words that we have heard will be ringing in our spirit. Um, you know, when words are released, everybody hears the same thing, but then we, we pick different things from the words that are spoken. So I trust God that each and every one of us will pick the ones that the Holy Spirit will activate for our much fruits. In the mighty name of Jesus. Heavenly Father, we are grateful, grateful for the time that we have spent, grateful for the seeds of your word that has been sown into our spirit. We thank you. We thank you. And so, Lord, as we uh, move on with these seeds, we declare these seeds will germinate in the mighty name of Jesus. We receive. For everyone that needs new vision and new dreams, we receive new visions. We receive new dreams in the mighty name of Jesus. We receive capacity to see opportunities in the midst of adversities in the mighty name of Jesus. We ask, Father, for every man that may be going through uh, a season of discouragement, a season of 
looking at what they have exerted efforts in and, and they can't see proof and, and their spirit is, is, is going down. Holy Spirit, we have been taught to rely on you as our partner. So we ask especially today for every man going through this season, Holy Spirit, be their partner, be their leader in the mighty name of Jesus. Uh, scripture says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. So Holy Spirit, we ask that you will be their shepherd. Let them not want direction. Let them not want resources. Let them not want provision. Let them not want favor in the mighty name of Jesus. Let them not want or lack the love they need to push through this season in the mighty name of Jesus. Holy Spirit, we ask, whatever is hidden, you are the revealer of truth. Whatever is hidden that needs to be revealed for our progress, for making our life count, for moving our lives as men and leaders and providers to the next level. Holy Spirit, we ask, open our eyes, open our understanding, guide us in the mighty name of Jesus for anyone facing temptation and they are almost caving in. Sweet Holy Spirit, we receive your strength today in the mighty name of Jesus. And we declare the effect and the power of that temptation is nullified in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, we speak peace over everyone's hearts. <laughs> peace, peace in the name of Jesus. For any man here facing a financial obligation and it looks like shame is looming, I speak peace, direction, clarity in the mighty name of Jesus. What to do to get that situation resolved, everyone reveals to you in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you for our families. We declare peace over our families. For those of us that are married, we speak peace over our marriages in the mighty name of Jesus. For everyone leading a business through these challenging times, Holy Spirit, we ask, make the difference in the mighty name of Jesus. We thank you, Heavenly Father. Lord, we pray for our pastor. We ask that you will replenish him in the mighty name of Jesus. <laughs> Help him to continually incline his ears to you in the name of Jesus continually guide him, refresh your grace over his life in the mighty name of Jesus. I thank you for our panelists today. Amen, 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 and amen. Seems um, Pastor Boy dropped off the call, and um, we receive all the prayers, and we thank God for a wonderful time this evening. What a time! What a day! What a program it has been. We appreciate everyone for joining in. Thank all our panelists. We thank all our pastors. Okay, Pastor Boy is back. Let him just um, yes, sir, pass away. Pass away, sir. Uh, brother Winger. Yes, sir. Go ahead, sir. Uh, okay. Where? What was the last thing that you heard? <laughs> we are praying for the panelists. Sir. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> 
Lord, we are grateful, grateful for, for the panelists. Thank you for the grace that you have put over their lives. Thank you for making them a vessel of honor. We ask, Lord, that you will refresh them in the mighty name of Jesus. We ask, as they have sown seed, we pray, Father, that you will replenish them a thousandfold in the mighty name of Jesus. We thank you, Heavenly Father. Thank you for everyone in this event. Thank you because we know testimonies are abounding as a result of tonight's encounter in the mighty name of Jesus. We thank you, Heavenly Father. We give you praise in Jesus' precious name we have prayed. Amen. Thank Amen. You very much. Amen. Thank you very much, Pastor Boy. Let's appreciate Pastor Boy with our emojis and um, Say thank you, sir. God replenish you too. God increase you. God bless you indeed. On behalf of the president and the West Coast, strictly masculine, and on behalf of every man, I want to say thank you for everyone still on the call. And I'm being reminded tomorrow is being celebrated as Father's Day. So may I be the first to wish you happy Father's Day. And I trust, going away with what we've learned today, our lives will count. God will give us everything we need to be fathers and influencers in truth and in, do, in, in deed. I want to advise we do something special and something different as we celebrate Father's Day. Be kind enough to invite me for lunch tomorrow. But more importantly, try and do something else different in the home. Let our wives know it's Father's Day. And so all through the services tomorrow, we'll be celebrating men. Please make sure you are in church physically and online. Drag a male to church tomorrow. Bring a male to church tomorrow. Let's celebrate men together. Happy Father's Day to everyone. Thank you for this wonderful time together. God bless you. Your life will count. This little light of yours will shine bright and brighter. Thank you very much. Have a good day, a best evening. God bless you. See you in church tomorrow. Thank you, Brad Benga, for the awesome work.